Good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices. Um, our first item of business today is to decide whether to say item five in private. Are members agreed? Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business is to report back from a recent fact-finding visit to Stockholm. So, Gavin. I thought it was a fascinating trip, and I suppose the, the lessons for me were, were two broad themes. The first one is in relation to how we might structure a Scottish Fiscal Commission going forward. We obviously met with the Swedish Fiscal Policy Commission and indeed uh, an organisation called NIER who do the forecasts and the government who do their own forecasts. Um, a couple of things really worth thinking about. One is how you resource, resource such a body. Um, there was, I think, a uh, surprise from most of the groups we spoke to about how our, our, our current body is resourced. Um, secondly, I'd say just the level of flexibility that their bodies seem to have and seem to appreciate, and actually government seems to quite uh, like them having, so they can take their own initiative uh, on various bits of work. And I think maybe the biggest one of all was just the, uh, again, a kind of, for me anyway, a cementing of this consensus that... Um, Whichever body you set up, however you set it up, they have to do their own forecasts um, if they're going to uh, provide a valuable service uh, to the government and to the country. So that was the first broad area. I think the second broad area where we uh, met another, um, a number of other organisations, including uh, a group called Open Lab, um, was on the preventative spend agenda, um, an agenda that has huge political support, theoretically, uh, everyone uh, is behind it. But as we know in practice over the last five years or so, um, there hasn't been even anywhere close to as much progress as we would like in some areas has been a degree of inertia. And I just think some of the innovation that we saw in Sweden, some of the approaches they're taking, might just be one of the keys that helps to unlock that agenda once again and push it uh, a bit further forward. So two broad themes, how we might uh, set up our fiscal commission going forward and how we might move forward uh, as a committee or as a country with the preventative spend agenda. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Anything you want to add? Hugely informative uh, visit. I think uh, Gavin's uh, summed up neatly uh, the, uh, the key areas which we uh, explored and, and where we've had the most uh, useful dialogue with the various groups which we met. Uh, in terms of the, um, the work of the, the Fiscal Policy Commission in Sweden and, and the issue around forecasting, they had a plethora of, of forecasts, perhaps, we, perhaps uh, almost too many, one might say. But however, having said that, the, the issue of having a separate independent body uh, providing its own forecast was seen to be crucial and clearly uh, it helps uh, Sweden have uh, you know, re robust scrutiny of its forecasts and also um, uh, from the, the uh, point of view of the work of the, uh, of the, um, the, the, the Fiscal Policy uh, Council itself um, on broader issues regarding economic policy. Uh, and, um, and so I, mean, I think that was a very useful um, model to explore. Interesting from their point of view in terms of the issues around independence because both the NIER and the Fiscal Policy Council are government agencies, although there seems to be a culture in Sweden where you can be a government agency but still be very independent of government and critical of government and appointments are in effect made by the bodies uh, themselves. Having said that, if you're going to start again in terms of uh, a new structure, I mean, I think, you know, a body reporting to Parliament rather than government would probably be much more in line with the EU rules and OECD advice on how you structure uh, such uh, institutions. And I think that's something that they acknowledged as well. So, but having said that, one of the advantages they had in terms of the way they're structured, I think from our point of view, it, it would not be um, the ideal model, was they did have access to the right amount of data. Um, in fact, I mean, they, they had um, close links between the different organisations uh, with government as well, and that meant that all the data they needed to uh, receive for, to make accurate forecasts, they had access to. That will be an issue, I think, for uh, a fiscal commission set up in Scotland, and so that's certainly an advantage which their bodies had there. In terms of prevention, yes, as Gavin said, uh, that the, the, they are having very much the same debates around preventative spend that we are, particularly in health, uh, where there's obviously the ambition to spend more on prevention, uh, but just the same political difficulties in terms of actually how you remove spending from one area of the service to actually invest it in prevention. And I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's clear there's no silver bullet there, and they're, they're struggling 
struggling with some of those, um, some some of that agenda as well. But you know, I think very uh, interesting indeed was the, the work on innovation, particularly in uh, in health services, which we heard about um, for, in in Open Lab and from independent consultants in uh, innovation in in healthcare. You know, um, more use of IT diagnosis on uh, you know, through IT systems uh, to some extent treatment as well, more individual access to health services from um, uh, you know uh, th using um, information technology you know using you know I iPads you know, iPhones you know all that kind of uh, agenda was uh, extremely uh, interesting I think that I'm sure there must be um, uh, issues there we can learn from uh, in Scotland and, and that's why it was encouraging to hear the open lab um, center which you visited which is looking to encourage innovation and innovative uh, thinking uh, when, when it comes to developing new services and technologies is working with Queen Margaret University here as well um, and, and those links are already there, so I think that's something which uh, the committee could explore further in the future. Yeah, well, I would endorse uh, what's been actually said by two colleagues. It was a, a very intense, uh, very productive uh, uh, visit. Um, uh, and um, what was interesting, I think, was uh, to look at the, the, the level of, uh, I don't know, consensus in terms of some of the, the kind of core issues. For example, one of the things that they have uh, in Sweden is a thing called the surplus target. You know, uh, whereby the budget has to be balanced over the cycle with a 1% surplus. And what, what that, one of the, the key aspects of, of that is that all the political parties agree on a maximum spending limit for the Swedish economy, uh, which is something which is, which is quite interesting. So this is almost a, a kind of self-denying ordinance for all the political parties that they wouldn't go beyond this, this particular uh, envelope that they, that they uh, uh, develop over a, over a, uh, over the, a, th a three-year period in, in terms of the, of, the, um, of the upper limit. But in terms of budgets, the, the surplus target is over, over the economic cycle, or there are arguments of what that economic cycle is. In terms of the Scottish funding, uh, sorry, the Swedish Funding Council, uh, I was certainly impressed by the way they do their work. They seem to be a very robust uh, group of individuals. Uh, they have on occasion challenged the government. And what they challenge the government on is not um, changes in policy, but they challenge the government on the government's implementation of its own policies. So basically, what they're there to do is to effectively hold the government to account as to whether or not the government is implementing its stated policy objectives. And I think that would be uh, something that would be important for our own um, fiscal commission. That's something we'll no doubt take forward with the cabinet secretary. The issue of um, innovation, I think, is uh, it was very important, and I think there was a lot of direct examples which we can more or less, uh, you know, transfer over to Scotland. Although there are some unique aspects of, of, of uh, Sweden which we could not, um, uh, but there are certainly a lot of ideas. And the open lab, I thought, was really interesting because it was a kind of you know, the, the way they talked about uh, design theory um, and a kind of, um, you know, looking at things from the user's perspective all the time rather than looking at things from a producer thing and going doing things the, the reverse. And so, uh, 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 what do people want and what policies can be developed to help those individuals or support those individuals rather than, you know, develop the policy, uh, you know, and this is how it's going to impact on individuals. So I think that was important. The other thing is... It's an independent thing or it's part of government as well? Well, it's funded uh, by three different organisations, uh, universities, uh, the county, the Swedish counties and the... The municipality, yeah. I mean, the way Sweden is structured, incidentally, is you've got the central government, you've got 18 counties, uh, uh, and you've got 290 municipalities. We found this quite extraordinary because health is decided at the, at the, at the 18 county level, but welfare is decided by the 290 municipalities. Now, I obviously thought this meant they would administer welfare at the 290 municipality level, which have populations ranging from about 5,000 to 900,000, incidentally. But no, it's not about administration. They actually develop their own welfare policies, including the amount of money they pay in welfare uh, by, on a municipality-by-municipality municipality basis. I know there would be a lot of arguments in the referendum about Scot where Scotland could have a distinctive welfare policy for the rest of the UK, but they seem to have them at that level which does seem extraordinary uh, to, from our perspective. Also, the taxation structure they have, 19% uh, of your gross income goes to uh, the municipality, 12% um, uh, to the counties. These can vary, but that's, that's in Stockholm. And only, only if you have a certain income level 
uh, do you then pay it to the state? And only 30% of people pay to the actual state, and the state funds things like uh, defence, um, uh, social integration, uh, um, foreign policy, etc. So it's quite interesting how they actually uh, devolve things down to even a fairly, um, you know, a small community level. So it's a completely. A, a different uh, structure to what we would have. Um, it was quite fascinating. Uh, they, they also, they, their finance committee is 17 members, incidentally, rather than the seven that we have, and there are eight political parties represented uh, on that. So I imagine that, um, uh, given that they meet apparently for a couple of hours at a time, I don't think they have as much in-depth questioning, perhaps, as we do. So it's not a question of looking at Sweden and saying everything they do is better than us. I don't think that's necessarily the case. And the municipalities have so much power that we were told by one of the finance um, committee members that they're trying to d build a railway. Uh, well, they've got a railway from North Sweden to Stockholm and they want to put an extra couple of um, lines of track. And because one of the municipalities on the route between Stockholm and the far north doesn't they want it, that's it snookered, basically. They don't seem to have any national mechanism of, to, to overturn that. So it's quite interesting. OK, so those who are not in Stockholm, any questions? Jean. Can I just ask what the Open Lab is? Yeah, well, the Open Lab is a kind of um, organisation which is, has been set up by, I didn't think it was a municipality. I, thought, I know it's a count, it's definitely a count, county um, universities I'm in the third one. I didn't think it was a municipality. I thought it was some other, I thought it was a pri possibly a private sector. Private private check private that. Yeah, uh, but anyway, these three organisations pay jointly for this uh, structure whereby um, s um, you have a kind of staff of seven people and they take folk in and they look at um, the various, they, they take on commissions. So for example, they were looking at a commission whereby um, how they could get people interested more in participative participative sport because they're building all these great sport facilities and they want to make sure people use them. So what they're saying to the folk is, what kind of uh, sports do you want um, to be to take part in these places? What would attract you there? Um, uh, for example, uh, you know, what kind of money, how much would you be willing to pay? Um, you know, what kind of times would be suitable for you? All, all these kind of things. So what they're trying to do is they're looking at things from an end user perspective and uh, they broadened it out. So, for example, what was the thing they were doing with the, the guy was doing with the, um, with the, 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 the glue, remember the guy in the lab downstairs? Oh, that's right, they were developing a kind of tourniquet oh. and they were also developing a different traffic uh, management system. So basically what it is, it's, it's a kind of brainstorming thing and students come in, they do 10, 20 week courses and they try and develop, a, they get assignments and they try and develop um, ideas uh, from the, the outside in, looking at things from the broadest perspective and then they try and come up with, uh, with, with uh, solutions. Um, Mark? Uh, yeah, um, I've been to Malmo with the local government committee when we were doing a, an inquiry into the sort of future of, of local government. So the municipality structure is something I'm familiar with. But um, I just wondered in terms of borrowing powers and financial powers at county and municipality level and how those are monitored. Because obviously one of the things we've spoken about is how um, any additional borrowing powers, etc., would be would be monitored, and obviously the discussion around bailout, etc., and, and what mechanisms exist there. Was there much information as to how that works in the Swedish context? Uh, you've got to have a balanced budget. So fairly, so basically, what it does is they overspend. Uh, in the first year, then they, ha uh, then they have to make that up in subsequent years, so they have to have a balanced budget, both at county, at county and municipal level. So it's, it's similar to the rules that apply currently to the Scottish Parliament, that the budget has to be balanced? But not on an annual, not in every single year. It's just you know, if you, they, if they you overspend. They do have flexibility. So if you overspend in year one, you have to pay it back, pay it back in year two and adjust your budgets That's accordingly. Right. But they can't borrow and pay back over a longer period of time. Um, I, don't, I don't think we explored that, did we, in ADT? Oh, I know, for capital, that's right. They can, yeah, we did actually explore that. They can borrow for capital, but not revenue. So for infrastructure, they can do it on a, they can do it on a prudential basis for capital, but they can't do it for revenue. Yeah. And the um, Swedish Fiscal Commission, is that what it's called? Fiscal Council, yeah. F fiscal Council. What, is, what does that... 
looked like uh, you suggested, um, Richard, that they had more access to agencies and other departments. So th I think this, this is there any similarity yeah. between what we're trying to do here and the funding in the work? I think, I think it provides a model that, w that we should look to. I think it was the six members of the, the board, is that right, who are generally economists. Um, and um, and the, 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 we met the chair, who was a professor. Uh, and so they publish a report annually in spring, which, as the convener said, um, you know, looks to the government's own policy and whether it's meeting its own um, uh, stated policy intentions through its uh, uh, through its economic policy and through its budget approach. And it, it, it but it doesn't do its own forecasting in the sense that it has. Uh, forecasts um, it relies on, which are produced by the NIER, the National Institute for Economic Research, who, who are a government agency, but very independent of government as well. Um, and, so, um, and so it looks to those forecasts, and then it will make comment on those forecasts. But although it's a government agency, I mean, fundamentally, um, you say they're drawn from academia, and they themselves, their board, basically make recommendations to the minister about who should be appointed to the board when the, when the replacement's made. And the, for, as far as I'm aware, the finance minister never turns those uh, recommendations down, so it has a degree of independence. Although the European Union would say it would be better if it was fully independent of government in terms of that level of scrutiny, and they did mention that. But there's a, as I said, there's a culture in, in Sweden where you have government agencies, but they are seen to be very independent bodies. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things about the Swedish budget is that when they actually decide on their maximum expenditure, uh, they have 27 departments, if you like, uh, in which each of them is given a maximum as well of budget. And within uh, altogether some 500 appropriations, so you've got smaller budgets. So within the 27 headings, they are just within the relative appropriations. Uh, so for example, um, you know, um, Although transportation is really done at a county level, they do have some uh, uh, national transportation, so they'll be able to have different things, perhaps whether it's rail, airport, whatever, and they can adjust budgets within that. But the important thing is that they don't break the maximum amount uh, in terms of the in each of the 27 categories. They have incidentally got uh, they've reduced their, uh, their their debt quite considerably um, to 30% of GDP, it was 75% in the 90s. So they are the highest in Europe, and now it's one of the lowest. Debt to GDP ratios. Anything else? <coughs> okay, folks. Um, <coughs> we'll get the Cabinet Secretary General we'll continue. Okay, our next uh, item of business is our final evidence session in relation to our Scotland's fiscal framework inquiry, in which we'll hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy. Uh, Mr Swinney is joined today by Government officials Sean Neill and Stephen Sadler. Uh, I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite Mr Swinney to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Kavira, and my apologies for detaining the committee earlier on this morning. I welcome the opportunity to take part in this inquiry on Scotland's fiscal framework. I have looked at the summary of evidence given with interest and note that there are common themes emerging related to both the process for agreeing the framework and the substance of the issues to be agreed. These concern the need for transparency and openness and the need for accountability and parliamentary scrutiny that the agreement needs to be fair and sustainable, and that to achieve this, the structures and working relations between the Scottish and United Kingdom governments need to be reformed and made more effective. We need to look at how we work together to reach an agreement as well as tackling uh, some of these complex issues. 
taking these points in turn, I also agree that transparency is a necessary requirement for the effective operation of a fiscal framework for Scotland. This is something I want to seek early agreement on with the United Kingdom Government. As noted when I last discussed this issue with the Committee on the 28th of January, there needs to be a balance between what can be discussed in public and what the, with the Committee while undertaking negotiations with Her Majesty's Treasury. It is certainly my intention that the Committee is advised of as much information as can be provided in as timorous a manner as possible regarding the sequence of measures that are being taken. I have also been clear that effective parliamentary scrutiny of the framework is important and that the Scottish Parliament will want to be assured that a robust and coherent fiscal framework is in place before it gives legislative consent to the Scotland Bill. The fiscal framework needs to be fair and it needs to be workable and understandable, so it is important that both governments can come to a shared understanding of how the various elements should work and what the implications may be. There are elements uh, of the fiscal framework that are currently not well defined, the principles of no detriment being perhaps the most obvious. The UK and Scottish governments must work jointly to address this. As Lord Smith noted in his report, there should be a shared understanding of the evidence to support any adjustments. This means that both governments will need to give careful consideration to how we practically embed this into an agreement on the fiscal framework that is clear, fair and transparent. Finally, the Scottish Government agrees with the Smith Commission recommendation that we need to review intergovernmental machinery to make it more effective and efficient. Smith recommended that the Memorandum of Understanding between the UK Government and the devolved administrations be reviewed. This work is underway, led by the Joint Ministerial Committee Secretariat, which comprises officials from the UK Government and the three devolved administrations. In tandem to this, I will look to agree with the UK Government the most appropriate governance arrangements to take forward the bilateral work on the fiscal framework, including the role of the Joint Exchequer Committee. Effective parliamentary scrutiny of these arrangements is important, and I hope to be as transparent as possible about progress. In terms of where we are now, I met with the Chancellor of the Exchequer on the 2nd of March to discuss implementation of the financial elements of the Smith Commission Agreement, including the fiscal framework. We both agreed that Scottish Government officials should work jointly with Her Majesty's Treasury officials in the period of the UK election uh, to uh, advance uh, progress. This allows officials to prepare a, dra a draft work plan and timetable for approval by UK and Scottish Government ministers as soon as possible after the UK election, and that work is progressing. Uh, I hope to meet with the Chancellor of the Exchequer on Monday to discuss the next steps in this, progress, in this process. Okay, thank you very much for the opening statement. That's very helpful. One thing, though, you didn't really touch on is the future role of the Scottish uh, Fiscal uh, Commission, and that was something we took uh, some evidence on. And indeed, you're probably aware that uh, members of the Finance Committee uh, have just returned from a two-day visit uh, to Stockholm, and we actually met the, Sco the Swedish uh, Fiscal uh, Council. And there's uh, quite an element of consensus among the committee, and certainly among our witnesses. Uh, in terms of uh, going forward with this uh, uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission. For example, uh, most of the witnesses agreed that the Fiscal Commission should be responsible for providing independent analysis and forecasts, um, I mean, rather than just being able to comment on the Scottish Government forecasts and able to do that more effectively, um, they should perhaps be able to do that uh, themselves uh, according to best practice guidelines produced by the OECD. Uh, and also, um, um, there's a widespread consensus that uh, the Fiscal Commission should also be able to have a role in challenging the government on the, the route it's taking and its uh, fiscal sustainability uh, in the short, medium and uh, long term, uh, in order that uh, it, it should be um, the, the Scottish Fiscal uh, Commission should be beefed up to provide uh, the people of Scotland with a more objective uh, macroeconomic economic projections. And just, just to let you know, the, 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 the Fiscal Policy Council of Sweden, what its remit is, it includes um, uh, to, uh, to assess whether fiscal policy is in line with healthy long-term sustainable growth, leading to long-term sustainable high employment. And effectively, um, what it does is it analyses uh, the government's um, own uh, policies to see whether they uh, are, going, are, are delivering what they said they would do. So what's your, your view on that? Many of these issues, Kavina, have been considered in the previous discussions that we've had around the Scottish Fiscal Commission, and um, the, all of the issues that you've raised are um, issues that I am certain will be considered when we look at the outcome of the consultation that's currently underway on the Scottish Fiscal Commission in putting that onto statutory footing, which will be 
a bill that the government intends to present in the final year of this parliamentary session to fulfil our commitment to put the Fiscal Commission onto statutory footing. There are, of course, a, a range of different opinions about what is the proper and full role of an independent Fiscal Commission. Where I am absolutely in agreement with the committee and the body of evidence that uh, you have highlighted, convener, is that the Commission must be independent, it must be practically independent and it must be seen to be independent in all of its actions. And that has been uppermost in my mind in how I have taken forward the establishment of the Commission and of course I have made clear to the Commission that um, whatever resources and approaches and arrangements they need to have in place to guarantee that independence, uh, the Government will give sympathetic consideration to providing. I think when we then look on to the role of the Commission, I suppose that's where I, you know, I've, I've set, set out to the committee before my view that the role of the Commission should be to essentially validate and question the forecasts that are made by government. And I do that because I think that is actually a more transparent reflection of what actually happens here. If I look at the evidence that um, uh, Edward Troop, the second permanent secretary at Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, um, has given to the committee, uh, I think on the 21st of January, Mr Troop effectively said that um, although the OBR is praised for its independence and its you know, distinctive forecasting ability, it's really HMRC that are giving the numbers to the OBR in the same way as they used to give the numbers to the Treasury. And I just no, I, I think that's a, a pretty honest reflection from Mr. Troop of what the arrangements are. And I would rather just accept that that is the transparent, honest reflection of the arrangements rather than trying to say, well, actually, the OBR or the Scottish Fiscal Commission has some independent capability to generate all this information and to come to this independent conclusion when, in fact, that's not really the case. What they're looking at is work that has been undertaken by the by HMRC to feed into the assessments made by the OBR. So my, my view has been that it's a more transparent approach for the government to um, produce the estimates, pass them to the Fiscal Commission. And as I've said to the committee before, the Fiscal Commission essentially has a veto on the forecast that I bring forward. I couldn't sustainably stand up downstairs in Parliament and say, well, here are my forecasts, and the first question members would ask me is, well, have they been validated by the Fiscal Commission? And if I was to say no, then I think my forecasts would be in some difficulty. So essentially, the Fiscal Commission has that ability to test a, and to veto the forecasts that I make. Uh, but they've been made on a transparent basis where we've shared the workings and the methodology with the Commission. The final point I'd say in relation to the issues that you've, you've raised, Convener, is on the point of what is the, 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 the role and the scope of the Fiscal Commission. Because one of the examples that you cited, Convener, was that the Fiscal Commission should be there to judge the long-term sustainability um, and uh, workability of the policies and proposals taken forward by the government. Again, this is just going back to the discussions that we had in the Fiscal Commission um, process earlier on in this parliamentary term. I rather think that's the business of Parliament. I think that's the business of Parliament to challenge government about whether or not elected members elected from right throughout the country to challenge the government as to whether or not the government has got its policy framework correct. I don't think it is the role or the scope of an appointed commission to essentially raise and consider what are fundamentally political choices for which ministers are accountable to parliament and members of parliament have the opportunity to challenge and scrutinise those uh, as a reflection of the proper and true function of, of, of parliament. So I don't want to labour this particular area too, too much. Just, just one question. I mean, you talked about the, the, the forecasts could be vetoed by the Fiscal Commission. How, how would they go? What would be the criteria for vetoing that? I say that my forecasts were not um, 
that my forecasts were not evidenced by the material I'd put in front of the Fiscal Commission. Okay. So, when, when the, so when the Fiscal Commission reported last year that uh, on two occasions that the estimates I had made were reasonable, I judged that to be um, a fair basis upon which to present those forecasts to Parliament. If the Fiscal Commission had come back and said we cannot verify these numbers and we don't agree with these numbers, I think I would have been in a somewhat more difficult position. Okay. I mean, one of the things that they have in Sweden that we don't have here in Scotland is a much more comprehensive array of data and statistics for many obvious reasons. I mean, obviously, it's, a, it's, a, it's an independent state with full access um, to all these, uh, all these information sources. But, uh, you know, we did take evidence from your officials, as you know, on the issue of data, and there seems to be... Uh, there are considerable concerns, as you've known, you've known about this for years, all, about data and the quality of data. I mean, for example, uh, the basis for calculating Scottish VAT uh, paid by Scottish households is a household expenditure survey pulling three years' responses and a sample of 500 Scottish households a year. Uh, and we've been told about the, the SNAP proposals, but, um, you know, what, what is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that the data we ha that, that is available is much more robust than it's been in previous years if we're going to take some very difficult decisions uh, in the years ahead? I think it's important to look at this in, in different components, Convener. The, the income tax data um, is currently generated by, um, by, by, by survey material, although we are working to strengthen that. That will obviously get stronger whenever the Scottish taxpayer base is defined, which is a process that will be um, taking its course and will be effective from the 1st of April 2016. Um, and the, uh, I should say the start of the, the tax year in 2016 17. Um, and the, so uh, one of the, the the elements of the Scotland Bill 2010 is that there is essentially a, a shadow period of at least two, but perhaps three years of duration, which will assess the relationship between actual tax collected and um, the forecasts that have been made. So there will be so steps in place on income tax to strengthen that data that's available in this new territory. The, the other uh, aspects of uh, taxes devolved, um, well, we have the collection arrangements on land and buildings transaction tax, we have the collection arrangements on landfill tax, and obviously these will begin to generate more uh, refined projection data as we see these taxes taking their course. Um, and then on the only other... Uh, obviously, there's aggregates, levy and air passenger duty, which will have their own mechanisms for collection. And the only other area where I think data is relevant in relation to the, uh, the, the, the current range of Scotland uh, bill powers will be on the assignation of VAT. And I do think there is uh, quite a bit of work that has to be done mm. to get clarity on the most robust basis for um, assigning VAT. Um, because it, it, it's not a, um, you know, a variety of different ways by which you could undertake that calculation. And it's important that we have that subject to a lot of scrutiny and consideration to ensure that we, um, we come to the correct conclusions on that particular point. Okay, now in terms of correct conclusions vis-a-vis -vis Barnet, I mean, one of the things that witnesses have expressed concern about is the uh, Treasury data. Uh, and their calculations in terms of Barnet are not uh, always published, or if they are, they're published in such obscure and Byzantine publications that they become very difficult for even academics to track down as opposed to uh, ordinary members of the public or even parliamentarians. I'm just wondering if in your discussions on intergovernmental machinery, the Scottish Government will be pressing for greater transparency in terms of the Barnet formula, its inner workings and the publication of some of the calculations that the Treasury um, uh, 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 produce, because um, there often doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason why specific um, uh, 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 things come fr through Barnet, you know, the, 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 how they come to the conclusions that they actually come to. We interrogate data very closely at um, spending review 
uh, and financial event times uh, to verify that a proper and full calculation has been made of Barnet consequentials. Um, there is a, uh, an explanation of the basis upon which the comparability factors are applied between different budget lines within the United Kingdom budget. Um, so, for example, on um, health expenditure, um, there will be budget lines in the UK budget for which we are we attract 100% comparability for Barnet formula purposes. But there will be others, for example, on local government, where local government finance is undertaken in a different fashion in England to how it is undertaken in Scotland. And our comparability factor on local government finance, if my memory serves me right, is somewhere around about 20%. So all of that, all of those... And then if I then go to... Defence expenditure, our comparability factor is zero on defence. So there is a rationale for whether it's, for example, zero, 20 or 100 per cent comparability. And that's a, that's a process of work that um, my officials are habitually involved in, making sure we are satisfied that those comparability factors reflect uh, a proper assessment of the eligibility for Barnet consequentials. I think beyond that, uh, we look, as I said, at every financial event very, very carefully at the allocation of consequentials uh, and to determine whether or not uh, those comparability factors have been applied in the proper fashion. And uh, that, does, you know, that does lead to um, additional scrutiny of whether the, the correct judgments have been arrived at to ensure that um, expenditure has been allocated in a particular way that can deliver particular consequentials. Uh, I think, would, would this, uh, in response to the question, would this benefit from more transparency? Then yes, convener, I think it would benefit from more um, transparency. And, and many of these issues are tied up with the uh, delivery of the statement of funding policy, which, as I've rehearsed with the committee on many occasions uh, over the last eight years, is a source of great satisfaction, of dissatisfaction to me, the way in which the statement of funding policy has arrived at. I mean, the whole issue of transparency was a major one, which so many witnesses actually uh, said. And, uh, but, uh, um, I mean, for example, um, you know, there's considerable doubt among respondents on whether it's possible or indeed desirable to create a fiscal framework that meets all the objectives, fair, transparent, effective and mechanical. The Institute of Fiscal Studies consider that any system meeting both of the no-detriment principles can also be transparent, effective and mechanical. Um, how, how do you feel about that statement? I, I think a lot of that depends on how extensive the no-detriment principle is applied. If the no-detriment principle is applied beyond the primary change of devolution of the power or responsibility um, and the, an appropriate transparent block grant adjustment is made, um, then, I, the, the, then I, I think it would be difficult, unless that approach is taken, I think it would be difficult to fulfil the various criteria that you set out there, convener. There is another question, which is about how we arrive at block grant adjustments. And as, again, we've discussed before in committee, just looking at the land and buildings transaction tax uh, debate uh, and the landfill tax debate, um, we had a difference of opinion with the UK government um, to the tune of about £60 million, um, which reflected about, um, well, in excess of 10% of the tax that we believed to be uh, able to be generated uh, because we used one methodology and the UK government used another. And the, the methodology that we used, I felt, was more soundly based because it was based on individual transactions within Scotland rather than a subset of a UK-wide picture. And I, I have to say, I, I found it qu quite difficult to get UK ministers to accept that we might have a better methodology than the Treasury had come up with. And I think this is quite a fundamental issue as we go through all of this discussion. Is it possible, is it conceivable that we might come up with a better, more reliable mechanism for assessing this tax 
than the Treasury. Is that possibly imaginable? I don't think it looks to me to be particularly tangible a prospect from the UK government's perspective. But you know, I was very confident that the methodology we put together was based on the creation of a model that was driven by Scottish property transactions, not by a subset of UK property transactions, where we know the property market is fundamentally different from Scotland and to the rest of the United Kingdom, particularly because of the effect of London. Um, so I think there, there has to be, to address your fundamental question, Convener, a willingness on the part of the Treasury to recognise that there actually may be another organisation that's got a better methodology of arriving at a particular conclusion. Okay. Um, switch to boring for just a moment, which is, uh, I mean, we've had quite a, a variety of different uh, suggestions in terms of boring. I mean, you'll know that Scottish Futures Trust supports, uh, for example, um, a prudential regime. The IFS is not quite so keen on that. But there's an agreement that there should be sufficient uh, boring um, uh, to allow budget smoothing, uh, you know, and to cover any forecasting risk and any kind of economic shocks. I'm just wondering whether the, the w what the Scottish government's view is on borrowing at this time. I mean, for example, uh, do you believe that um, there should be no limit, or do you think there should be a limit set? I have to ex I have to accept that we are part of the United Kingdom, so therefore we um, are. are, are our arrangements have to be compatible with the um, fiscal framework of the United Kingdom. I, 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 I think that would be to fly in the face of a constitutional reality. Um, so there has to be some degree of, well, there has to be a compatibility between our approach on borrowing and the framework within which we operate and the framework of the United Kingdom. Um, I think there is a need for um, three key elements to be, uh, to, be to, to be delivered in relation to borrowing. Um, firstly, um, there must be credible opportunities for the Scottish Government to invest for the long term through a distinctive approach on capital borrowing, which meets our requirements. We have, as the committee will appreciate, taken a different approach on capital investment to the rest of the United Kingdom, and I would want to see that opportunity entrenched in the post Scotland Bill arrangements. Secondly, there has to be enough um, flexibility to uh, enable the Scottish Government to deal with the greater financial risk that we will be carrying because we will have um, more of our budget will be dependent on taxes raised as opposed to the block grant delivered. Um, so there has to be greater ability to deal with that risk. Um, and finally, uh, there has to be I think, sufficient flexibility to reflect the changing dynamics of the constitutional arrangements to take into account the fact that we are taking forward more distinctive f fiscal responsibility within Scotland and having greater control and flexibility over borrowing is an essential uh, component of that. OK. Um, so, I mean, to a degree, that a, a relatively... Uh, higher level of borrowing in Scotland would mean borrowing in the rest of the UK would need to be lower in order to meet a, a, a particular borrowing target and maintain market confidence. This is something that a, a number of witnesses put forward and actually is the, the kind of system that's uh, established in a number of countries. What I said at the outset is that we have to accept that there would be a requirement to operate within the UK's um, fiscal framework. And I think the the question becomes um, whether or not we are actually being uh, given any more material flexibility as a consequence of these borrowing arrangements or whether we are essentially um, having to operate within a, a particularly restricted framework. And that, um, that, I suppose, is the key question that has to be determined by the borrowing arrangements. Canada, of course, is a country where they don't, there were sub-state um, legislatures don't have a borrowing limit set by the federal government. So it is actually possible within that. It, it, it is possible, well, but I think, in, in, in for me, to, to look at the, the reality of the, 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 the financial framework of the United Kingdom, the legislated for fiscal mandate of the House of... which the United Kingdom Parliament has legislated for, 
and to pragmatically reflect the political outlook of the current United Kingdom government. I, I could argue for that, but I'd rather f argue for things I've got more chance of winning. Indeed. Do you, do you believe, though, that the Scottish Government, if it does borrow, should be able to borrow on the mar on open market? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Just one last uh, point before I uh, uh, allow colleagues from the, the committee in. Um, we talked about the adjustments just briefly um, earlier on. We've had um, a lot of evidence, particularly from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, about adjustment mechanisms and how difficult it's going to be to ensure that any any adjustment mechanism, even one that's reviewed periodically, uh, will not have uh, potentially uh, a major downside uh, for Scotland because of differences, for example, in income tax, uh, the proportion of, uh, of um, income tax raised in Scotland relative to the UK, for example. I'm just wondering what kind of method of indexing the Scottish Government would prefer to see implemented, or is that something that's still under uh, discussion? The issues are under discussion, but if, again, if I go back to the discussions that I had with the UK Government about land and buildings transaction tax, and I appreciate a lot of water has gone under the bridge since then, but the original command paper of the UK Government said there would be a one-off adjustment on the devolution of stamp duty and landfill tax. Now, my interpretation of one-off was there was just the one, that was it, a sum of money, done, end of story. And then it became clear there was going to be, the UK government's view was, well, there had to be a one-off adjustment and some form of indexation. There were other things that they tried to apply, which we managed to see off. But what I eventually accepted was that there was an argument for indexation, and I made a suggestion that we should relate that to the GDP deflator. Um, so th there are various mechanisms that could be used um, to reflect to essentially update block grant adjustments and to keep them in line with changes in, in values. And these are, you know, there are a whole variety of different mechanisms that could be used uh, if we decide to go down the, the route of indexation. But I think the point that I, I, I feel I have to remind the committee is the original proposition from the UK government was a one-off adjustment and no indexation. Yes, indeed. Mm, okay, I won't go into that any further because I'm sure colleagues will come in on that. Um, I'd like to thank you for the answer so far and then uh, um, open out the, the, <coughs> the committee um, session to uh, colleagues. First person to ask questions will be Richard to be followed by Mark. Thank you, Green. I want to return to the issue of the uh, future of the Fiscal Commission. Um, and um, I accept what you, what you said, um, Cabinet Secretary, about the role of the OBR. In effect, it, in effect it's using... Um, uh, treasury forecasts in terms of its work, uh, but it strikes me that you know just because the OBR are doing, is doing it that way, it's not necessarily going to be the the best system for Scotland um, uh, in itself. And also that we just know how important having accurate forecasting will be for our own fiscal policy going forward. So, on that basis, uh, you know, wouldn't it, wouldn't it make sense indeed to empower the fiscal commission to? Make it generate its own forecasts. I think for two reasons. First, because if it's going to review the government's forecasts, then surely it needs to have its own forecasting role itself anyway. I mean, the best way to do that would be to produce its own forecasts. And indeed, you know, it seems to me also that the experience which we just um, uh, had an insight to in our visit to Stockholm there was that the independent body providing forecasts there, National Institute for Economic Research, these forecasts weren't wildly different from the government's forecast, but there is, seem to be, you know, there is a good check and balance in terms of providing accurate forecasts. So isn't that something that, that would be worthy for the consideration, given the Fiscal Commission, that role as it goes forward? I, 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 I don't want, it, at this stage, convener, to, to close down any discussion on this point. There's a consultation underway, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I happen to be in front of the committee midway through a consultation process. I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving my opinions as they are today, but I, I, I stress at the outset of answering Mr Baker's question, uh, I, I don't want, I sh perhaps should have said this in my answer to, to your questions, Convener, I, I don't want in any way my remarks today to be um, perceived as, as closing down particular options, and I'll, I'll consider all of these questions. Um, I do think there is a, um, you know, I think Mr Troop's comments to the committee, I think, are, are helpful in the sense that they clarify um, 
the, the, the nature of the OBR process. And then when I look at the example that Mr Baker's just given me about, um, about the example in Sweden, essentially what that involves is the government doing the work and a fiscal commission doing the same amount of work. And that is rather resource intensive. Whereas what the way that I've taken things forward is to say, well, the government will do the work, but I will ensure that the Fiscal Commission has the ability and the capability to interrogate and scrutinise all of the work the government does to its independent satisfaction. And to acknowledge, and I think I've acknowledged really quite clearly today, that I would be unable to sustain a fiscal forecast that was different to the conclusions arrived at by the Fiscal Commission. So I think it's really a, a, a pragmatic question about um, whether it's whether we need to set up a two. Well, yeah, I would have to. I'd have to do the work because I'm the finance minister. I've got to do the work to calculate what I think is going to be in the forecast. Um, the question is, do we need to set up? a comparable infrastructure to the one that I have to use to generate these numbers? Or can we give the Fiscal Commission absolute access to everything we do and every way we do it so that they can verify that it's a robust process and it arrives at a reasonable assessment as a, as a consequence? And that I politically make it clear to Parliament that I essentially accept that what the Fiscal Commission says uh, has a veto on my projections. And the Cabinet Secretary for his answer and also appreciate uh, the, 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 the point he's made that we're midway through the Commission and uh, I'm grateful that he's not wishing to, to close off any, uh, any avenues or any considerations around the, what comes back in that um, consultation process at, at this point. I think it's worth saying though that there are obviously examples across Europe where what's being used by these such bodies is in fact independent forecasting rather than the government's own forecasting. One of the issues that has come up again and again, and the convener mentioned it too, is access to data. And indeed, the Scottish, the Scottish government's own officials that came at one point and said they had um, problems accessing certain data from the UK Treasury, from HMRC. Um, is that something that the Cabinet Secretary has raised with the Chancellor directly, or is that something you think would be worth raising with him? Because it, I mean, having access to appropriate data for the Fiscal Commission and indeed for the Scottish Government is going to be crucial moving forward. The, the, the whole question, can I just, before I answer that question, can I, can I just highlight the, the, one of the points which the, the Swedish Fiscal Policy Council made to the committee in written evidence where, um, in 2013, where the, the, they said that the, um, its role is not to make economic forecasts or budget estimates, but instead to assess and make independent judgments. Um, so the, I, I'm not quite sure the, the Swedish Fiscal Commission is forecast made by the National Institute of Economic Research, which is a separate body from government. It's a government agency, but it's that a separate government, a separate body from the government who make their own forecasts. Mm. So that, well, that it, might provide a... In, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, I suspect some of that is dealt with by um, the arrangements we have in place um, for uh, the, the, the verification work that is undertaken by the, the, uh, the Fiscal Commission. But as I say, we'll, we'll okay, consider okay. these... We can consider these points. On the um, question about data, um, we, we regularly discuss with the UK government questions of um, data access. Um, I, in, in my uh, discussions with the Chancellor, I haven't personally raised those, but they are essentially part of the official discussion that we have about having available to us the quality of data. And of course, that was an important implicit part of the discussions that took place around the block grant adjustment on land and buildings transaction tax because there was um, and this you know I, I was clearly advancing a set of forecasts based on uh, an evidenced model which I thought was of a superior quality to what I was dealing with with the uh, with the from the UK government but we will of course continue to advance that argument because we need to have um, that quality of information, of course, when it comes to, as I said to the convener earlier on, the issues around uh, particularly income tax and VAT, uh, income tax calculation and VAT assignation, 
um, that there is a necessity for us to have really good quality data in, the, in this respect. Convener, I, mean, I think we've, um, you, you've already touched on the importance of having transparency around the mechanisms uh, at which the, um, the, the various issues are uh, decided, including a no-detriment policy uh, and uh, adjustments to the budget. I mean, would you agree, Cabinet Secretary, that in terms of Joint Exchequer Committee, in terms of how these mechanisms function between the two governments, that there's regular reporting by yourself to this committee on their operation and indeed by the Chancellor or appropriate ministers at UK level to, um, to committees in Westminster? Yes, and, and I think also the mechanisms have got to function more effectively than they have functioned. Um, the, the Joint Exchequer Committee has not met since 2012, and I think that's I think that's deeply unacceptable. But I think it didn't meet over that period. I think it didn't meet for a whole variety of reasons, probably not least of which the referendum was happening and there was a I think a difficulty of getting a meeting of minds around the table, if I could put it as gener as gently as that. Um, but there, that has to be a meaningful framework. You know, I, I spent a long time discussing with UK ministers, along with Mr Crawford, the remit of the Joint Exchequer Committee because I was determined the Joint Exchequer Committee operated on a different basis to how the statement of funding policy is arrived at. Well, the statement of funding policy is, yes, discussed with me, but it's agreed between the Chancellor and the Secretary of State for Scotland, and I'm not a party to its agreement. And I, I find that absurd. So the Joint Exchequer Committee has got to operate on some basis that gives me some ability to be able to get to a point of agreement, as opposed to agreement being explained as, well, the Treasury has decided this is the way it's going to be, and that's what gets applied. Now, the Joint Exchequer Committee, I, I've worked, you know, the, the line of argument I've taken has been to get that committee to create a mechanism that actually fulfils what the Prime Minister said in his a speech, it must have been the day after the election, I think, where he said he intended to govern on the basis of respect. And that those principles need to be applied into the workings of the Joint Exchequer Committee to make it meaningful. And I absolutely accept that there has to be transparent reporting to both parliaments in that respect. Thank you for that. Um, Mark, to be followed by Jean. Thank you, Convener. Um, on the issue around transparency in, in terms of the operation of the Barnet formula, um, the, we took evidence last week from Professor Alan Trench and from David Phillips of the IFS. Um, Professor Trench said in relation to this year's budget, there is no particular reason why historic data could not be provided. And David Phillips of the IFS said he'd managed to get hold of the spreadsheets that the government uses UK government uses to do the calculations and couldn't see a reason why, subject to people agreeing it, they should not be published on the day of the budget. Do you, have you made any representations to the UK government around publishing the Barnet information and do you think they should publish it alongside the July budget that we're expecting to take place? I, I don't really see any reason why not. Um, certainly, um, if I think to... I, I'm... I'm I think I would maybe perhaps have to explore what other information was being sought here, but certainly what, what the Director General Finance receives on the day of the budget from the UK government is um, essentially a spreadsheet which shows the changes that are being announced by the Chancellor to public expenditure and how it is judged by the Treasury to be applied through the Barnett formula. And that will go through a number of budget. Obviously, it varies depending on the degree of change that is being announced. Um, it goes through um, the different budget lines. It goes through the currency, CDEL, RDEL, ODEL, uh, AMI. Um, it sets out the perspective of that, those changes for, a, for future years. Um, and obviously, I, th that for me is a crucial document because that then gets poured over by my officials to make sure it's, it is a proper reflection of what's been announced in the House of Commons and that it properly takes into account all of those changes as we would consider them to be done. And we then also 
um, verify that when it comes to the various technical mechanisms for the transfer of that money, that that's scrutinised as well, so that we don't have a sort of public announcement level and a technical change level to budget arrangements in the House of Commons that are different. And you know, for the record, there's, in my, my experience, there's never been a difference on those points. But we do that verification nonetheless. So I'm, I'm not sure... Um, and then the, the, the comparability factors, are they published? Yes, yeah, the comparability factors are in the statement of funding policy, which is already published. So I think the, I, I would certainly would be happy to explore what more information um, individuals believe should be published to enable that judgment to be arrived at. And what I eventually report to Parliament, when I report to Parliament that I believe the consequentials from the budget to be X and Y, that's as a product. I, 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 probably, I probably don't publish the letter that comes from a Treasury official to the Director General of Finance. I, I can see no reason why that couldn't be published uh, on the day of the budget. I certainly would have no objections, but I would have to accept that that's a, a correspondence, government-to-government -government correspondence. I'd have to check that that was uh, able to be published with Treasury consent. Um, but I, I don't see any reason why that couldn't be published. Um, for, further on the issue of transparency, and, and you've, you've highlighted the the discussions that you had around LBTT and um, the, the block grant adjustments, but also in terms of the lead up to the, the decisions being taken, obviously there was a, a change made at a UK level which altered those discussions um, materially. Um, has there been any indication around the approach the Treasury is likely to take given the significant change to tax powers being devolved that's likely to come as a result of Smith, but also with the, the Scottish rate of income tax that is coming in advance of that, uh, around how the budget process works, essentially, because um, I know that there have been some frustrations expressed around the ability of the Chancellor to stand at the dispatch box and produce a rabbit from the hat that nobody expects, while this Parliament itself is in the middle of a, a consultation around rates and bandings. Um. I haven't explored that with the Chancellor, and I, I, I think, to be fair, um, uh, the Chancellor operates within a United Kingdom parliamentary environment around budget handling, and I operate in a Scottish Parliament environment for budget handling, and they're different, they're very different. Um, so, I, I think... It's really not for me to say to the Chancellor, look, you know, you've, you've got to change entirely your whole way of budget handling in the United Kingdom because the Scottish Parliament does it this way. I, I could certainly make that argument, but you know, we'll see how I get on with that one. Um, the, I think there are perhaps some questions that, um, that this Parliament needs to think about given the fact that we are taking an increasing number of tax decisions the extent to which the Parliament is confident its arrangements properly protect Scotland from what the committee has looked at in the past of the question of gaming. I think the committee was used that terminology. Um, that, that Whether our arrangements were in some way able to be undermined because of the ability to exercise um, some decision-making in, in, in a different Westminster context. Just sort of leading on from that into the intergovernmental relations point, the, um, uh, the IFS last week seemed fairly certain that the Treasury would adapt itself to the new circumstances of devolved uh, tax powers, but the other evidence that we've received suggested that it was unlikely that the Treasury would change the way it does things, and I think... You, you may have been hinting at that with, with, with your answer. Um, do you think the way that the intergovernmental relations are developed and how formalised they are might influence, might have a greater influence on Treasury behaviour? I, I think this is, a, this is a cultural question. I think it's a question of whether or not um, it, can be, it can be accepted that the view that we put forward as a devolved administration or that we may be able to arrive at as a, you know, as a proposition could have 
um, as much, if not more, validity than something produced by the Treasury. And I think that's a that's a real a really deep cultural question, and I, you know that's what I will be expecting to come out of this process because we cannot satisfactorily operate on the basis that um, we just have to accept what the Treasury says. If that was the case, then you know why would we bother developing better and more informed mechanisms if we just had to accept what the Treasury said as the last word? Um, so I think the, there is a cultural question. You can have all the rules you want. You know, the, 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 I fought very hard to get the Joint Exchequer Committee remit structured around the basis that we should arrive at an agreement about the issues. And that's, to me, that's the right way that it should be structured. Um, but we have to... But then I've ex accepted to Mr Baker that I cannot say that the Joint Exchequer Committee has functioned in a proper and effective fashion since it was established, uh, other than to get to that point. Um, because the agreement that we reached about the block grant adjustment and land and buildings transaction tax was a one-to-one uh, -one discussion between myself and the former Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Um, so I think if we're going to have good, orderly, transparent arrangements that we can report upon to Parliament, as Mr Baker was, was, was correctly arguing for, then we have to have a basis of uh, working that accepts that there may actually be a better way of doing this than the way suggested by the Treasury. Just finally, on to the, the no detriment principle. Um, you've given an articulation of how the no detriment one uh, works, because there's no detriment one and there's no detriment two, uh, in terms of how that, uh, if that is applied, there could be the, the, the more mechanical process in terms of calculation of, of, of future Barnett formula. There's been some, well, there's been a lot of discussion about how no detriment two can work in principle and in practice. That is essentially that through the exercising of policy, there shouldn't be a detriment created. And if there is, there may need to be some compensatory factor. Um, and some of the discussion has revolved around how you could determine cause and effect that a policy taken had had been the ultimate factor in, in a detriment being created, but also at what point the detriment would materialise, because it could be that a decision that, I mean, if you take APD, for example, as a, as a very uh, obvious example, a decision on APD that is taken in Scotland could be argued to have a detrimental impact to perhaps Northern England airports, and there's been some uh, discussion as to whether that would be the case. But it could be that any detriment that is created real or otherwise, doesn't materialise until several years down the line. At what point then does the compensatory mechanism kick in? So have you given any thought as to how no detriment to can work in practice? I think, I, I think no detriment to is fraught with difficulty. And I think it's, um, I think it's perfectly conceivable how no detriment one operates. It's a transfer of power and responsibility. And there's a financial adjustment that has to be made there. It has to be agreed. And I think that's, I think that's a, a, a tangible uh, way to proceed. But I think there's two principal arguments against no detriment two. Um, one is it's uh, almost impossibility to agree without... Um, significant dispute and debate and I think the IFS made that point very clearly to the committee um, in its evidence last week. And secondly, there's a philosophical question about whether it's justified or not. Because if we are um, if we are taking on a responsibility and we make a success of it then we should bear the fruit of that, I would have said. And if we get it wrong, then we have to bear the consequences of that. Because I'm confident that if we operated on the basis of we exercised our responsibility, it was devolved to us and we didn't get it right. And we then went to the United Kingdom government to say, look, we didn't get this right. We'd like some support to deal with that. The UK government would say no. So I think it undermines the point of devolution that um, there should be the ability for, um, uh, for there to be... Um, any consequential account taken of the um, uh, the implications. Now, the one uh, possible exception to all of this is the question of forestalling, where the UK government accepted 
that the actions that they took in changing stamp duty land tax when they did would have an effect on our revenue generation in the year one of LBTT. And uh, that's where they've accepted a direct financial consequence of their actions, um, at the, essentially at the moment of devolution, which has taken, been taken into account in the first following discussions. Yes, it, it feeds into some of the evidence that Professor Heald had offered to the committee around the potential, for, as, as you've mentioned, for tax gaming. Um, and given that the Treasury itself would have a much wider array of uh, income levers at its disposal, um, it could make changes that might materially affect Scotland, um, but could compensate for them through other taxes, which were not at the, the behest of the Scottish Parliament to, to change in order to perhaps offset any detriment that was created. I think that gets us on to a wider discussion about the appropriate levels of powers and responsibilities that are held by the Scottish Parliament. And Mr MacDonald won't be surprised that uh, I, he and I share a, a view that, that those powers and responsibilities should be broader than they currently are, which enables a, a parliament and a government to take a broader range of decisions reflective of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Um, but I don't think that can be captured. I don't think that, that can be captured in the no detriment principle. It's essentially captured in the um, approach that is then taken to public expenditure, and that would apply through the Barnett formula. Followed by Gavin. Thanks, Convener. Um, at the time of, of the vow, I think, just to paraphrase, that we, Scotland would become one of the most, or the most devolved fiscally, uh, fiscal region in the world. Um, that, I think, suggests politically, at least, that there's, there's quite a uh, high expectation of uh, a Scotland given these extra powers. Um, and in the Cuthbert's recent paper, there's a concern about only being given power over one tax and being responsible for living within our means without uh, the responsibility or without being given responsibility for the ability to grow the economy or for other powers. And that's something certainly that has been in the chamber here, an argument that the government has made uh, that Smith Commission doesn't go far enough. Are we in a position now in these negotiations to, to uh, correct any of that or to raise these issues? Um, it, we have that opportunity. Um, the... Uh, when the Prime Minister came to Edinburgh a few weeks ago to meet the First Minister and myself, um, he agreed to consider further proposals that we would put to the UK Government beyond the agreement of the Smith Commission, and the Scottish Government will uh, supply those, um, uh, those points and proposals uh, to the UK Government. And, and they would be along the lines of the points that Gina Urquhart raises about um, needing to establish greater balance uh, within the, uh, the proposals than emerged from the Smith Commission. I mean, do you accept that if, if Smith was enacted as it is, that Scotland potentially could be worse off? The, the, essentially what it... What the Smith Commission report does is that it places greater um, responsibility um, on the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government, and it conveys greater risk to the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. And therefore, we have got to have in place the mechanisms to enable us to balance that risk and to ensure that risk is effectively and carefully managed uh, for the benefit of the people of Scotland. The um, and another, I think, criticism has been that the Smith proposals were put together very quickly, perhaps too quickly, um, and were kind of ill-considered con Ill in a sense. Um, do you feel that that process is still going too quickly, and, and uh, or do, you, do you believe that there will be enough time given 
to uh, negotiate into, a, 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 I guess, a better set of, of proposals? The, the, uh, I can't prejudge what consideration the UK Government will give to the additional proposals that we make to extend the powers of the Smith Commission. Um, but I, uh, you know, I can only take the Prime Minister at his word that he said he would look at them in good faith and, and consider them. I think in terms of the, you know, the parliamentary process for the handling of the legislation on the Smith Commission report is uh, becoming slightly clearer to us. It's not absolutely crystal clear, but it's becoming slightly clearer. And there will be, um, it's a legislative process at United Kingdom uh, level, which will um, be taking place over the next few months. And I think it's, you know, we'll have to wait and see exactly the time that's allocated for that to make sure it's done properly and adequately. There will be a couple of other major issues um, which will affect the, the handling of this and whether appropriate time is given to them. <coughs> Excuse me. Which will relate to, principally to the fiscal framework and its significance in relation to a legislative consent motion that this parliament will be asked to support. And I've been absolutely crystal clear with the committee and with the UK government that we will not put a legislative consent motion to the parliament until such time as we have an acceptable fiscal framework in place. And uh, we have to make sure there's a lot of big issues in the fiscal framework, as the committee is quite understandably hearing about, and we need to have the opportunity to properly consider those questions. And finally, just on, on that point, if, if the, the case was that um, what you were proposing and was accepted by the Scottish Parliament uh, as, as a proposal was rejected by the Westminster government, um, what happens after that? Um, we would, would this Parliament have to live under the Smith as accepted by Westminster or put forward by Westminster, regardless of whether we were in agreement with it or not? No, the, 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 well, it would, depend on, it would depend on a number of things. It would depend on whether this Parliament was prepared to pass a legislative consent motion. Um, that would be one important point. Um, if the Parliament was not prepared to, the question would then be for the UK Government if they were going to ignore the Sewell Convention and apply these changes um, without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. And that has never happened before, so we'd be in new territory. And I think that should be avoided. Perhaps I could just ask one more thing, and that is that um, the Smith Commission, as is, I assume, is unacceptable to you, or do you see it as unworkable as it, as it currently stands, without um, developing further powers for the no, Parliament? I, no, I, I think the, the Smith Commission, my, my position on the Smith Commission is that um, the government accepts its conclusions as um, a, a further devolution of additional responsibilities to the Scottish Parliament. It has to be translated in full into legislation, which it wasn't in January in the draft clauses, and it wasn't last Thursday with the publication of the Scotland Bill. So um, it has to be, um, uh, that process has to be completed uh, satisfactorily, um, and there has to be a fiscal framework that goes with it that enables the Scottish Parliament to exercise these responsibilities with due ability to deal with the increased risk that we are carrying by the exercise of these responsibilities. And those will be two key judgments in how we take forward our, our handling of this issue. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Jean. Uh, Gavin, to be followed by Mark. Um, you had a couple of questions on block grant adjustment already in relation to Smith. Um, block grant adjustment in relation to LBTT and landfill tax for 2016-17. Where are we with that at the moment? Uh, we have no agreement in place and no discussions have happened about it. Okay. Are there any discussions on the, on the agenda? Is, it, is there a meeting lined up in order to, to do that or is it just... Um, well, uh, there will be 
I, I suspect they'll be part of the discussions that we have about the wider fiscal framework, um, because the, one of the, the points that the uh, Treasury ministers were anxious to ensure was that um, there was no essentially read across from the one year discussion that we had about 15-16 into wider provisions. Okay. Um, thank you. Assignment of VAT, um, this committee has been, we've really been told by experts that there are, there are two broad ways of doing it. You could do it by place of consumption or place of production. Um, we've not really heard uh, an alternative to either of those two. Does the Scottish Government have a view at this stage on how uh, VAT ought to be assigned? It's, a, it's, a, it's a, one of these issues where um, I'll be looking carefully at the implications of different methodologies as part of the discussions that I have with the UK Government on, on this question. I mean, as a matter of principle that you don't have a view at this stage on whether it should be one of, one of those... I mean, obviously... Well, it, well it's, it's a rather... I assume Mr Brown will understand it's a rather material point to negotiation. So sure. I'd... OK. Um, you were asked by the convener or one or two others a, a little bit about borrowing and you, you gave some of the background to the issues that would have to be considered uh, about borrowing with uh, Smith Powers and anything else. Um, but do, I mean, does the Scottish Government have a view at this stage on the likely quantum, um, the likely amounts, or are you just really talking about principles? Uh, we are, I, I set out earlier on the principles sure. that I think have to be taken into account. Um, I, I think we've, we've got to have a borrowing regime that enables us to um, borrow for capital uh, investment purposes in addition to our CDL allocation. Um, secondly, that we've got to have the ability to um, borrow for the revenue risk that arises out of exercising the degree of responsibilities that we are carrying. Um, and thirdly, there has to be sufficient flexibility for the, 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 the Scottish Government to make judgments about the most appropriate level of borrowing, notwithstanding the fact that I accept that we have to operate within uh, the constraints of the UK fiscal environment. Okay. So, I mean, the principles are clear, but I mean, the Scottish President doesn't have a view or isn't willing on, to put on the record a view of what those, what sort of figures you might be talking about. That's correct, yeah. As, oh, you know. Okay. All right. Um, as a matter of principle, I mean, you, you've said you're, you're living within the limits and so on, and so you didn't think you would, you would get terribly far. But, I mean, as a matter of principle, do you think the Scottish Government should have unlimited borrowing powers, or at least limited only by the markets or those who would be prepared to, to lend to you? Or should there be some form of limit put into the uh, whatever fiscal uh, agreement is reached? Philosophically, I believe yeah, the, Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government should be free to exercise uh, appropriate and sustainable borrowing limited by, uh, well, limited by its own judgments. That's philosophically where I come from. But I accept that there is a UK fiscal framework, there's a UK fiscal mandate, and there's a political outlook of the UK government that I can't ignore in terms of trying to give the committee answers to what I think are going to be realistic uh, settlements of the borrowing question. Okay. And in relation to, I mean, we've, we've heard three theories, I would say, at this committee about whether or not the um, Scottish government borrowing should be underwritten ultimately uh, by the UK government. Some have said it should be underwritten. Some have said it shouldn't be underwritten at all, and others have suggested it should be underwritten to a certain limit, but anything above that limit is publicly not underwritten. Do you, does the Scottish Government have a view on whether some or all borrowing should ultimately be underwritten? My view is that the Scottish Government should only undertake borrowing that it considers to be sustainable. Um, so, therefore, um, the judgments that we arrive at... Um, have got to be sustainable fiscal judgments about the borrowing that we incur. I think everybody would accept that point. But I mean, in terms of the un should should there be in the kind of fiscal framework, should it be explicit uh, that ultimately it's underwritten so that market because markets will obviously take a view and this could reflect uh, the rates and so on. Should should it ultimately be underwritten by the UK government or should there be something uh, within the fiscal framework that says it's not underwritten? This is this is entirely a matter of judgment for the Scottish that's Government. A, I think that's a, a very material point of negotiation within the fiscal framework. 
Okay, so no no firm view you're willing to, well, to put on the record. Uh, there's a, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here to be as helpful as I can, but there's a negotiation to be undertaken. Okay. All right, I'll leave that one uh, just now as well. Um, in terms of other points, you were asked, I mean, you have been asked by a number of members about the Fiscal Commission. Um, you say there's a consultation going on just now and that you, and you're listening and, and open to ideas. The impression I got from you, and it may have been an unfair impression, but the impression I got from you was that you actually had pretty fixed views about forecasts and, and the role of... I, I, I'm, and I'm giving you a chance to... to perhaps my interpretation was, was unfair and incredible. but I, I did get the impression that you do have fixed views on um, whether or not there should be independent forecasts. Well, I, I've, I, I'm simply... I've, I've given the committee the caveat that there's a consultation underway and I'm looking at it, but equally I can't deny that I've come to the committee relatively recently and given a pretty firm view that I believe the government should do the forecasts and the Fiscal Commission should challenge them and verify them. And that's been my... That, so that's a, that's a crystallisation of my position, but I'm open to consideration of the issues. Now, I think... Uh, Many of the judgments I have to, to manage is whether or not um, costs within the public sector are justifiable. Now, I have to incur the cost of um, having in place the necessary expertise to provide me with um, robust fiscal forecasts. What essentially the, some of the debate is inviting me to do is to make provision for that twice. And generally, I don't like making provision for things twice within the public purse. And generally, the Finance Committee doesn't approve of that in its scrutiny of my actions. So I'm simply saying that I'm trying to take a pragmatic way that enables the work to be done for it to be challenged, scrutinised, investigated, interrogated, and ultimately to have the ability to say this is vetoed without us incurring the cost twice. Now, that's my pragmatic view of it. Now, if the committee takes a different view to that, then I will, of course, consider that. If the consultation exercise takes a different view. But ultimately, um, I'm the person that has to defend the cost involved in doing that exercise twice. 99.9% of the time I'm, I'm with you ah, on the... On the it's always uh, an the exception well, to prove it's, the it's, rule, it's, isn't it? I suppose, I mean, in, in all seriousness, seriousness, I mean, I suppose for me it, it is about um, making sure there is backup and actually there's, there are checks and balances because it, when you're only talking about two taxes, for example, the consequences of getting it wrong uh, are smaller. Once we get to a stage where, there are, where there's income tax, for example, where there... Uh, is assignation of VAT and so on. The consequence, every tax that's added, the consequences of getting it wrong grow. And the, the point that was made to us pretty strongly by uh, NIER in, in, in Sweden was that, it, in their view, it was extremely difficult uh, to validate um, somebody else's forecast if you hadn't done your own forecast initially. They, they felt if you hadn't done a reasonable amount of the workings and thought carefully about the models and the assumptions, you would be hampered in judging uh, somebody else's forecast by simply looking over their workings. But let, let me make two points in, in relation to that. The first is the point is to go back to the point, one of the points that Mr Baker made about the discussions, I think it was Mr Baker, or maybe in the convener, about the fact that when the Swedish exercise was done by both parties, there was very little difference, if any, between the forecasts. So, um, I simply, I mean, I, I'm not as close to these points. Okay, Cabinet Secretary, but one of the points that was actually made by the government was the fact that another body was doing these forecasts made them much tighter in terms of their own forecasting and made them much more disciplined and accurate in terms of their own forecasting because they knew there was another body kind of looking over their shoulder, so to speak, looking at the same data, <coughs> uh, coming to maybe much the same conclusions, but it tightened up their, their operation and enabled the forecast to be more accurate because they knew there was an independent body with full access to the media and well respected <coughs> that could do that. So that's really... Well, well but that brings, me to my, that brings me to my second point, which is the, the, the way in which the Fiscal Commission has operated to date and how it can operate in the future. During the summer of last year, 
um, I didn't just send the Fiscal Commission a sheet of paper and say, how do you like these numbers? The Fiscal Commission had the opportunity to interrogate the model that we had put in place to calculate these taxes and to scrutinise that to their satisfaction. So, it, essentially, and, 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 and I make it absolutely clear on the record today that anything the Fiscal Commission would want us to ask to their satisfaction, they can ask us and can scrutinise and can interrogate about our approach. And ultimately, I accept that the Fiscal Commission has the ability to go to Parliament and obviously to the media and say, we don't have confidence in the forecast that the Finance Secretary has put forward. And for me, that's disastrous news if that was the outcome. So there's no, you know, the, exactly the points that you make, Convener, about um, my officials and myself having to operate on the basis that we are subject to very firm scrutiny on this question and that we have to be reliable and robust about what we're doing um, is the obligation that the Fiscal Commission places upon us. I, I, I won't dwell on this because, for the simple fact, I think it will be a, a far longer debate for, for another day at the end of the consultation period. Just to say the view, I think they will be in a better position, though, to judge your forecast, in my view, if they have done some of their own workings too. Because it, what we got was basic, for, for LBTT and landfill, we basically got a statement saying we endorse these as reasonable. And I didn't get the impression from them that they could have come up with alternative numbers. They could have questioned some of your assumptions, but my firm impression was they couldn't have come up with uh, £250 well, million pounds instead well, of £260 well, million well, pounds well, I, or I so on. Well, I profoundly disagree with this point. And, I, and, and, we, and okay. this, is a, this is a significant point for us to have because it gets to the nub of what I think is going on here. If the Fiscal Commission had said, we believe, if there were two extra letters in that sentence, we believe these figures to be unreasonable, then I'd have to go back and run the numbers again. Oh, that's all it would have taken for them to say, we believe these to be unreasonable, and I'm back to the drawing board. So, so, I, so I, I profoundly disagree with the argument that there isn't anything else, else the Fiscal Commission could do, because I would have then had to go away and work on those numbers to get to a point where the Fiscal Commission had the confidence to tell Parliament those numbers were reasonable. I think they're accurate, or they're not accurate to the, the degree that, that, that perhaps well, consider well, they should well, be. Well, know. the Fiscal Commission were giving, a, a, by the use of that terminology, were giving a clean bill of health to the estimates the government had put forward. That's what we asked them to do, and that's what they did. If they didn't think that was the case, they would have said so. But, but where, where are they in it? Let, let's pick a number. Let's say, for example, you said we think it's going to be £250 million that we will collect. My impression was that they would not have been in a position to say, no, we think it's £270 million or we think it's £230 million. My impression was they could, they could simply look at the modelling and say, yep, that seems reasonable. My impression was they couldn't come up with an alternative figure. Now, I may be wrong, but that was a pretty firm impression I got. Well, they, 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 they could have asked us to... Uh, look again at particular assumptions, and we could have run the numbers again. And if they said, "Look, if you know, if we think we think that your estimates about uh, property price growth in Scotland are wrong, uh, go away and do it for you know X percent rather than Y percent," then we, of course, would run the numbers, and and they would be able to. And because of the interrogation that they had undertaken of the model, they would know all of the assumptions that would underpin the model that we'd put together. So they could have challenged anyone, whether it's about property prices, about number of transactions, about value of properties, about incidence of sales. They could have challenged any of that and got us to run alternative numbers. OK. Uh, I, I won't dwell on I mean, I, 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 we, we clearly disagree slightly, but I, I think it's something we can explore in greater detail when that's the only item. Um, in terms of the, the other question that, that the convener did put you about the Fiscal Commission, though, um, was the idea that they could... Uh, give a, some kind of commentary on the fiscal performance of the government. And I think you, you seem to resist that because you felt it was the role of Parliament. I simply put the question, though, do, do you not think that the OBR doing that has enhanced parliamentary scrutiny at a UK level as opposed to detracting or somehow usurping parliamentary scrutiny? I think the, 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 the way, the, the point I responded to earlier on um, 
I think was in the context of an assessment of proposals and policies, which, you know, to me is the territory of Parliament. That's what Parliament should be considering. Um, essentially, undertaking independent economic forecast, then it's you know, a perfectly permissible uh, role for a fiscal commission to undertake. But I think one of the points that struck me about the committee's consideration of the concept of the fiscal commission um, some time ago was that the committee wished the fiscal commission to be established, which I reflected in the way in which it was taken forward. Um, the fact that it was going to have responsibility to look over um, just two taxes at that time, uh, land and buildings transaction tax and landfill tax, but that we remained open to developing the role of the Commission as our responsibilities were extended. And that is the basis upon which the consultation paper has been constructed and the draft bill has been, has been set out. And if I may give you a separate topic, just in terms of no detriment or no detriment to, uh, as, as it seems to have been called now, um, you said earlier, I've written this down, it's fraught with difficulty, you're questioning whether it's justified and so on. I mean, did, did you make these points during the Smith discussions? Because obviously it was in the, it was in the agreement, uh, you were involved in that agreement. Did you make these points um, at that time or have you now looked at it and thought, actually, this is a bit more tricky than we first thought? What, what's your stance on that? The, 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 words, um, a, the words of the fiscal of the Smith Commission are, are words that I signed up to um, at that time. As I have looked at, uh, certainly what I would say I had, that I thought was the, the, the most important issue, because it was uppermost in my mind in terms of what I contributed to the Smith Commission, was about block grant adjustment because it was a particularly, well, I think I've made it clear to the committee, it's been a pretty fraught process. So essentially, um, uh, the, the primary consideration I had was to make sure that was correct. As I now look at the detail of the Smith Commission report and the concept of there being some further calculation beyond, uh, I think that's uh, uh, a calculation that is more fraught with difficulty. Or by John. In terms of the block grant adjustment, um, you said that um, starting with LBBT, the, originally there was no indexation, but you've proposed indexation to the GDP deflator. So but was that not always implicit in it? Or are you saying that the original idea was it would just be that sum of money always not even uprated for inflation? In the command paper that was published to implement the Kalman Commission report, um, I, I don't have the precise wording in front of me, but I can prov I've prov provided it to the committee before. Um, the, the wording was something like, um, there shall be a one-off adjustment when these taxes are devolved. And that was it. And you know, I interpreted one-off adjustment to be a cash sum that was, that, that was debited, and that was it. And the UK government then opened up the argument about indexation. You don't think indexation to the GDP deflator is really too much of a departure from what was originally proposed. I mean, it does seem quite well, a, a, reasonable. It, like, well, it, it, it was an attempt by me to try mm. to get some agreement of a reasonable basis for proceeding mm. on the block grant adjustment, where I thought I was, um, mm. I was perfectly entitled, mm. and Parliament could have required me mm. to hold out for what was in the words of the, uh, the command paper, because that, that was the basis upon which mm. the legislative consent motion was given mm. by the last Parliament to the Kalman Commission proposals. Now, obviously, we do need indexation for the income tax powers and for um, the SRIT, I think it's to the um, income tax base um, of the rest of the UK. Is that your favoured option for Smith? Or, or, I mean, there's been some discussion of uh, indexing it to the revenues rather than the base. Do you have a view on that? Or? Well, uh, uh, what we... What we successfully argued during the, the Kalman Commission proposals that we should move to the um, what was essentially the Holton mechanism and um, we argued for that and we secured agreement on that so it's a uh, we think that's the um, uh, the, uh, the, the the most robust mechanism for doing that so that's that's the base so you would you want to do that for Smith as well and I suppose one of the other issues that's come up a bit in the evidence is how population changes should be taken into account. Should, should that 
should it be you know per head or should or should we just allow for the fact that uh, we want to get the benefits of growing our population uh, if we can do that that that's in, in a sense that some of that gets into the no detriment to argument that if we are actually if we if we are growing our population and there are benefits arising from that i think we should see the fruits of that it also relates to the wider argument about fiscal responsibilities and how we should be able to exercise those to um, ensure that we retain the, the, the benefits uh, of uh, growth in the population within Scotland. So, so the corollary of that is you wouldn't, you wouldn't seek to be protected from the possibility that the, the rest of the UK population will expand more quickly than, than Scotland's? Well, I think what, what, there's essentially, this is another of the, 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 the wider range of risks that we take on as a consequence of these responsibilities. So if we are taking on these risks, then we have to have mechanisms in place that enable us to manage those risks and to deal with those risks uh, as different outcomes begin to uh, materialise. I mean, when you propose new taxes, I mean, the most striking one recently has been national insurance. I mean, do you kind of work out a policy position on block rank adjustment as part of that? Because obviously that could work positively or negatively in various ways. Well, in a sense, some of this goes back to what my answer to Gavin Brown about 2016-17 on block grant adjustment. There's, you know, we don't have an established block grant adjustment methodology for the devolution of the new taxes. Um, we've, um, you know, we've got, we've come to an arrangement about 15-16, but we don't have a mechanism in place for later years, and that's essentially the core of the um, the fiscal framework. It's got to wrestle with these questions. Can I just ask you, I don't know if this is strictly relevant, but I'm curious about the national insurance. Is that, is that just more revenue which would be spent on anything, or is it particularly tied to the devolution of particular powers? Um, that, well, it's, it's about providing us with the ability to influence one of the key costs of employment that employers will wrestle with and to try to, to use that to encourage and to boost employment within Scotland. So it wouldn't be tied particularly to the devolution of particular welfare powers? It could... No. no. OK. Um, sorry, that was probably not strictly speaking relevant. Moving <coughs> on to no detriment. I mean, you said in Smith you were mainly focusing on the block grant adjustment. I mean, I don't suppose you, you want to be um, coupled too often with um, George Osborne, but it appears that he was saying the same thing when he gave evidence in the Treasury Committee and that he was relaxed about tax competition and it was mainly about the block grant adjustment. So do you think there's going to be much disagreement around that particular issue of no detriment? Well, I took, <clears throat> I took some encouragement from the Chancellor's comments to the Treasury Select Committee that he, he, he and I were perhaps looking at the same issues and dilemmas and how difficult it would be to, to, to calculate these. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the IFS... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the IFS quite correctly highlight that this, you know, there's a lot of difficulty contained in some of these arguments. But, but was, I mean, was it clear from the discussions of the Smith Committee that they did have a much broader view of it? I think actually what this... I can give you my impression, but I think what, what the Smith Commission was looking at was, yes, the block grant adjustment, but secondly, the fact that... Um, if we took particular policy actions and we made a success of them, we bore the fruit of them, and if we took bad decisions, we carried the risks of that. I think that's what was in the Smith Commission's mind. I don't think there was a sense, and the, and the point about, you know, there'd been a fair no detriment application of the no detriment principle, was I think, you know, my judgment of that at the time was that um, members of the Smith Commission were looking at that from the point of view of what happens when the power gets transferred, that you don't get it transferred with an advantage or a disadvantage, you get it transferred neutral. Okay, now we're interested obviously in, in transparency and how the, <coughs> you know, the negotiations take place, but I suppose I was also interested in what you said about um, you know, the legislative consent motion around the fiscal framework. So, I mean, is it kind of <coughs> guaranteed from the UK government that they won't seek to introduce any of the things we've been talking about into the re legislation, which will obviously be um, the, the preserve of the, of the UK Parliament, or if, they, or if they do that, that those bits of the legislation would require a legislative consent motion? Has all that been agreed, as it were? The, 
Essentially, the, what has been agreed by the mm. UK Government and the Scottish Government is that we intend to implement the Smith Commission mm. recommendation that there requires to be a fiscal framework put in place. Um, that is, has not been proposed to be put into statute and it certainly doesn't form part of the Scotland Bill that's been published. Um, so, and that is really what work has been, what the Chancellor and I discussed in March, it's what's been going on in discussions between officials while the United Kingdom Parliament um, uh, was dissolved. And um, it's what really will be picked up now. But I've also equally been clear with the UK Government that the fiscal framework has to be in place before we ask Parliament to consider a legislative consent motion because of the significance of the issues within the fiscal framework that would affect Parliament's view on whether it wished to give legislative consent or not. I mean, do you see the Joint Exchequer Committee having a role in this or is it just going to be minister to minister, basically? Or? I think there, 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 there could be a meaningful role for the Joint Exchequer Committee. It may, essentially, the dialogue that's going to take place about the fiscal framework will be amongst the players mm -hmm. who are the members of the Joint Exchequer Committee. Whether we call them Joint Exchequer Committee meetings or not, I think is perhaps is relevant to answering Mr Baker's point about what's mm -hmm. the transparency about those negotiations. But largely, I expect these discussions to involve the Chancellor, the Chief Secretary and myself. Um, so. And, and, and any transparency around that? I mean, will, will, we, will there be any well, I, publication I, I, of what happens? Or what, I've, what, I've, what I've said to, to, mm. to the committee before is that I want to, uh, to be as open as I possibly can be with the committee, notwithstanding the mm. requirement to conduct a negotiation with, the, with, with UK ministers. This is probably stretching it a bit as well, but I was interested in your letter on the... NPD hub programme, and I wondered if that kind of classification of expenditure as public or private, do you see that as having any relevance to um, negotiations with the UK government, or are they, are they just being affected by the same requirements from Europe anyway? They, they, they are, yes. Sir. Yeah. So. They've got the same issues, and they've mm. got the same, um, the same relationship to the Office for National Statistics in coming to a view on these matters. Would it have, would it have any f effect eventually on, on the Barnett formula if some of these things are classified as public no. expenditure no, rather are... than private expenditure? No. 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 Okay. Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, last but not least. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I thought you were very generous uh, to the Westminster system as a whole when you said that you didn't expect them to change really much given, despite the fact that the whole of the UK now is, is facing a different system uh, with budgets and all the rest of it. And, I mean, I just wonder if we are storing up problems for ourselves, because if we take something like income tax, they control the whole income tax system. They set the bottom rate, which is effectively the personal allowance, which is effectively a nil rate band. And yet we are expected to set our budget first and somehow hope that that nil rate band and the rest of the system won't have too much of an impact on us. And potentially we set our budget and then they come along and do something in March completely different, hits our budget. I mean, would we then have to go back in April or May with a supplementary budget? Um, I think... I, I don't want in any way to suggest that um, I find this acceptable. I, I, I kind of come to the view it's, it's the reality of what, I, what, what is out there. You know, there's a UK government that can, has a different budgetary framework to the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Parliament could decide to change its budgetary framework to give us uh, more of a chance to operate on a level playing field with the UK government. And that would obviously be up to the Parliament to determine if that was the case, so that Parliament was able to... Excess, but now that we've got wider responsibilities, we would be able to exercise them in a different fashion to the way in which they have been historically exercised. So I think there are, there are ways in which the Parliament can decide to react to those. They, they are they're not really issues for me to initiate. I'm serving the Parliament on these questions, uh, but I think it's certainly a question that the Finance Committee um, could consider if it wished to do so. 
Yeah, so you certainly wouldn't object if we were to say quite strongly that we felt that really the UK should be setting the, the, out, the bigger framework first and then we should be building on that. That would, that would be a, a reasonable position yeah. to do. I mean, we had some quite uh, strong evidence from some of the uh, um, witnesses we had. Professor Jeffrey said that really England needed to be disaggregated from the UK, uh, certainly for budget purposes, uh, if we were going to really make the system as a whole kind of work. I mean, is that again something that you would think was positive? I think there's going to be uh, I, I, I think there's going to be a whole series of dynamics that will arise out of the changes to the financial arrangements that will follow from the changes to the constitutional arrangements. And um, that's why I don't think that the process of constitutional change has in any way reached um, a conclusion because there will be more issues that get raised out of the application of first the Kalman powers and then the Smith powers, uh, which will require further consideration. I mean, we've talked a bit, and you've said yourself how important it is to reach agreement uh, with the Treasury, but, I mean, we are in a devolved situation, and it seems to me that the power still remains with the Treasury and at Westminster, given that. But, again, we've had witnesses who have said when there are disagreements and disputes, there should be an independent arbiter who could then say, well, this is, you know, you're saying the block grant adjustment should be X, the Treasury is saying it should be Y, the arbiter decides that it's somewhere in the middle or whatever. Yeah. Is that a possibility? Uh, I, I think there, there is a case for that because, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm expressing the hope here that listening to the Prime Minister talking about the fact that he governs with, re with respect to the devolved administrations, well, that view must, must take into account the fact that his government may not always be correct in the judgments it comes to. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I, I simply cite that you know, I wasn't when it came to the block grant adjustment on land and buildings transaction tax. I wasn't simply saying, um, you know, the Treasury weren't saying here's a number of 526 million, and I was saying, oh, I've got another number, it's 461 million, and I haven't any basis for coming to that number. I, I had an entire model based on Scottish property transactions, which they didn't have, mm -hmm. which built up a position of what. I believe was a reasonable estimate based on the actual property market in Scotland. So I think that, um, and I think that should have been taken more into account than just saying, well, you know, we've got this gap. Mm -hmm. I felt we had a, a much superior model um, that would allow us to uh, make a judgment about the, 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 the amount of revenue that would, that would be generated. But, I mean, at the moment, the reality is they're big and we're little. They've got all the power. If they've got a nice Chancellor, then he'll listen to you, and if they've got a nasty Chancellor, he won't. Well, I think that that, that, that's, uh, that doesn't take into account the Prime Minister's commitment to govern with respect, okay. which is what we'll hold them to. OK, that's, you're fairer than I am, I think. Going back just to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, I don't know if I take a slightly different line from my colleagues on the committee, but I mean, in the first place, I did get the impression off them that they are, have been struggling a bit uh, with the amount of resources, not just financial resources, but people resources, and they've all had to put a bit more time into this than I think they had anticipated. And that's just with the two small taxes, although I accept they're still, I suppose, settling in. Um, and I, I would have a question about the amount of resources they might need. I mean, I suppose in the first place, do you feel they've got enough resources at the moment? Well, I, I, I've, I've made clear to the committee and to the Commission that um, I will be sympathetic to the resources that they require. And, mm. uh, you know, we, we, we've set it up on the basis that um, it's independent of government. It's housed in the University of Glasgow. We're grateful to the University of Glasgow for their... Uh, that they're hosting of the, the Commission. I'm very grateful to the Commission for their contribution. Uh, but if they require more resources, then uh, I will uh, happily consider what resources they, uh, uh, they require. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've heard, obviously, the arguments from some of my colleagues that uh, somehow it's better that, you know, we have two yourselves produce, as the government produce the forecasts, and then uh, they do it as well, or somebody else does it. But... I mean, it seems to me the counter-argument is that if you've got very strong checks, and obviously it's got to be adequate, uh, adequately resourced, um, then checking on what somebody else does is equally valid. 
And I mean, my model would tend to be Audit Scotland, who, who don't actually do anything themselves, but they go around government, local government, everything, looking very thoroughly at what is done and then commenting quite thoroughly. So, I mean, is that a model you see that could apply to the Fiscal Commission that they're doing? Maybe it's not called audit, but that kind of process of examining rather than actually doing it themselves. Well, that's why I went through the work that we been undertaken to get confidence within the Commission in the model that we had put together. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's, that, that's, where I, that's, that's how the system, in, in the way in which I've set it up so far, and you know, notwithstanding the fact that we're midway through a consultation and that my view isn't fixed, um, that's been the basis of it, that the Fiscal Commission were open and had the opportunity to challenge and test anything they wished to challenge and test about our arrangements. And, um, and, and that should be to their, to their absolute satisfaction and they should have the resources to enable them to come to that conclusion. Um, given the fact that I accept that they've got a right to challenge utterly the uh, projections that I bring forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just wondering, going forward, would you anticipate them, you know, perhaps giving a slightly more nuanced comment on your forecasts? Because, for example, you know, the point's made that they've said up till now it's reasonable, and you've made the point they could say it's unreasonable. Um, but when Audit Scotland say go in and look at Glasgow City Council, they will not just say it's good or it's bad. They'll say, well, these bits are good, but they've messed up on council tax or... You know, and, and they'll go into it in a bit more detail in their comments. I mean, is that, would that be a kind of halfway house that rather than the Fiscal Commission doing something completely different, they just gave a more detailed comment on the forecast? I think I, you know, I, I've cited one part of their, of their conclusion, you know, one sentence of it, but the Fiscal Commission reported more broadly on other points and made a, a number of other points mm -hmm. uh, in addition to the one that I've cited. So... Um, you know, really, it's it, it, it's a matter for the fiscal commission. They are an independent body. I, you know, I I don't direct the fiscal commission, so it would be inappropriate of me to say what I thought they should they should be doing. It's entirely up to okay. the commission to determine. So they are open, able to give a more uh, detailed. That's great. Thank you. Um, I mean, VAT has been mentioned uh, so far, and again, different arguments about how it might be done, how it might be assigned. I mean, it seems to me that it's quite important that they do take, we do take account of um, value added in Scotland. And so, for example, I've got a biscuit factory in my constituency. All of these biscuits go south. Um, if all of their work, if, if we're only looking at the consumer and who eats the biscuit and we get the VAT on that, then a factory like that, which adds huge value, uh, to the input we would not get a share of. So, I mean, it seems to me it would be more logical that we should be getting a share of the VAT at every step, not just at the final step. Um, I think that I, I would acknowledge that there is a, um, there's a substantial area for debate on the VAT question about how assignation takes place, and that's material part of the conversations we've got to take forward with, mm -hmm. with the UK government. And input from the committee in terms of the setting out of issues that the committee believes should be implicit within the fiscal framework. I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with how the committee intends to conclude its inquiry and if it intends to report shortly, but if the committee uh, does intend to report, it would certainly be helpful to have input on the areas where the committee believes um, particular um, conclusion should be arrived at. Okay, thank you. And I think just one area, other area I wanted to touch on was uh, the kind of borrowing thing. I mean, we've talked about how the whole question, and you've been, I think, again, been reasonable about what you've said, that our borrowing could impact on the UK and therefore it's reasonable that uh, there be some agreement and rules about how that operate. It's also been raised with us that uh, local government has a lot of freedom to borrow and obviously the prudential framework and I just wonder how they fit into that picture. I mean, if we are having an agreement with uh, Westminster and our borrowing could impact on them, then the same applies to us, that local government could impact on our borrowing. And it, I mean, it just crossed my mind, are we, do we take account of that enough? When you're looking at your borrowing figures, are you including local government borrowing within that? So local government 
government, Mr Mason, is, is, is well familiar, operates on the prudential, uh, through the prudential code. So each local authority individually has to be confident in the sustainability of the borrowing that they incur. And they are entire, fully and entirely responsible for that commitment. Um, and I think it's... And, and they have to be mindful in coming to that judgment about the, um, the the resources that are going to be at their disposal to service such borrowing commitments, which is a product of the UK fiscal framework into the bargain. So nobody is immune from it, uh, wherever they undertake their uh, the borrowing activity. Uh, a figure or some kind of rule about how much Scotland could borrow, should we have that just for the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government? No relationship today uh, between the um, any borrowing commitments of local government in Scotland and the borrowing arrangements that are implicit in the Calman Commission proposals. So there's no relationship there at all. So that yeah. hasn't been established. So we, we now have, we now essentially have a precedent. We're in 2015-16. We are able to exercise our borrowing responsibilities, and there is no relationship between our borrowing obligation, our borrowing, the, the obligations that arise out of our borrowing interests with that of local government, and I don't think there should be. Right, well, I suppose that, that is my question, and I, I don't have a view on it, but I'm just wondering, because, I mean, if, say, Glasgow, which is a bigger part of Scotland than Scotland is of the UK, um, you know, if they did mess it up debt-wise, we would have to bail them out, wouldn't we? Uh, well, I, Glasgow City Council under the Prudential Code, are entirely responsible for their, the sustainability of their borrowing. Right, so you're comfortable that we can basically leave local government on one side and we just that's, concentrate on the Parliament? That is where... That's, that is clearly and without debate the details of the Prudential Code. OK, thanks very so much. OK, thank you. Uh, that concludes questions from the committee. Just one uh, wee area I just want to add, uh, ask a question or two about, and that's uh, regarding indexation. I mean, Malcolm and others touched on it. I also touched on it earlier on. But I notice you, you, you mentioned that um, Holton was a, a method that you favoured. But uh, in evidence uh, we received, I quote, Evans, which said, uh, the imbalance between tax and population share, which is something, as you know, touched on earlier, could be altered by decisions of either government leading to a migration of top earners from north to south or vice versa. Consequently, the conclusion was indexation to changes in UK tax base. The Holton method was not suited to Scotland. I'm just wondering why you feel that is suited to Scotland. But further on, uh, the, Inde the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, considered that no method for calculating adjustments for subsequent years will meet the Smith principles. Um, I think I'd, I'd, I think I'd have to look at that in some more detail, uh, Kavira, to give you a, a substantive answer on that. I think, uh, in a sense, part of what you're raising would be essentially a, well, a, a hypothetical consequence of policy decisions that a Scottish government might take on tax levels. And I would, you know, before I, you know, rather than just treat it in that fashion, let me take that away and explore whether there is more I can share with the committee that would, um, uh, that would give a more definitive view on that point. OK, I'll just, we'll just, I'll just give just a bit more information on this. I'll just give you, uh, again, the, the IFSC, indexation to the percentage change in the rest of UK revenues will insulate Scotland from UK shocks and be neutral if Scotland's revenues grow at the same rate. However, Scotland may be adversely impacted by changes in the rest of the UK to the devolved tax. So it's not just about decisions taken here, it's about elsewhere. And, uh, of course, Dr Cuthbert adds that, and I quote, the method spelled out in the command paper, paragraph 2.4, Point one four creates an unacceptable mechanism whereby decisions that were made by the rest of UK government could yank the Scottish government's chain and force it to act either by increasing tax or by cutting devolved services. So he's looking at effectively how decisions in the UK are going to affect uh, uh, us here. Um, uh, um, and, and again, we, we had, we had, in, we had um, details from IFS about um, it was not always clear whether the term revenue was being rigorously used or was loosely related to tax base. And I think clarification on that's uh, needed. Mm -hmm. can, can I just ask you one, one, one further question, though, in, in terms of that, which is uh, 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 changes to the personal allowance uh, would impact on the size of the tax base. 
Um, I'm just wondering how this would impact on the indexation of the block grant adjustment for income tax. Well, that, that, in, in a sense, that, that, that's a material point about the debate about whether or not income tax is a fully devolved tax. Uh, you know, the, the Smith Commission report um, at paragraph 75 says income tax will remain a shared tax. Yeah. And uh, you said, so there, there are clearly implications of the sort that uh, you raise, convener, and um, they have to be reflected in um, the, the, the way in which we take our decisions, and they have to be reflected. You know, there's a, there's a, there, is a, there is an issue here about no detriment, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that is, a, in a sense... I will have, the France Minister in Scotland will have equal powers over the rates of taxation to the UK, to their UK counterparts. But on allowances, UK ministers will have control and Scottish ministers will have no control. Mm -hmm. So the consequences of rate changes, I think, are issues that... You know, we take our decisions, we live with the consequences. Issues such as changes to allowances and some of the characteristics of tax where we have not got comparable powers, they raise issues of detriment. And I think perhaps that is a, is a helpful way of illustrating the issue where we, have some, where we have a power, a comparable power, or we don't, perhaps give rise to some of the issues around uh, about, about detriment that need to be considered. But does that not mean that indexation is going to have to be constantly revisited? I mean, I know you were talking about in terms of land building transaction well, tax, etc., that you were talking about one-off, but, I mean, for example, like Professor Ronald MacDonald suggested that that alone would need to mean a reform of the Barnett formula. I, I, I don't think... I think the aspiration that I think has come through some of the evidence that there is a mechanistic solution to all of these things is wishful thinking. Yeah, yeah. I, th I, think, this, I think the problem <coughs> is, is that a lot of people have said that, 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 that there's a, a, a circle that can't be squared in terms of some of these things, me having a mechanistic system with fairness, transparency, uh, no detriment, I I, cannot I, be squared. I, 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 there will be... There, there is a necessity for... Uh, dialogue to take forward some pretty difficult issues that will be contained within the fiscal framework. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's preferable to get them to the point where they are they require as little reinterpretation or interpretation or revision in the years to come. But I think if anyone goes into this thinking, there'll be a fiscal framework and there'll be no requirement for revision or reinterpretation or further debate thereafter are engaged in wishful thinking. OK, thank you very much. That's clear. Um, I mean, I'd like to thank you for your evidence uh, once again uh, today, Cabinet Secretary. I'm just wondering if there's any further points you want to make to committees that perhaps Definitely you haven't that, come on. OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to call a recess until 11.45 to enable members to have an actual break and to have a change of witnesses.
Is away. Come on, just about to start. Session. Our next item of business is to take evidence in relation to the Care of Scotland Bill's financial memorandum from the Minister for Sport, Health Improvement and Mental Health. Mr Hepburn is joined today by Dr Maureen Bruce of the Scottish Government. I will welcome our witnesses to the meeting and I would like to invite Mr Hepburn to make an opening statement. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Can I say I am very delighted to be back uh, before the Finance Committee. I am also grateful for the opportunity to appear uh, before you today to speak with you about the financial memorandum to the Carers Bill. And as you see, I am joined uh, today by Dr Maureen Bruce. Uh, as you uh, know, the aim of the Bill is for adult and young carers to be better supported on a more consistent uh, basis. This is so that they can continue to care if they so wish in good health. And I am sure this is an ambition that we all share for Scotland's carers. To do this, uh, they should have a life alongside caring. We intend to achieve this by extending the rights of carers and young carers in law. We also want to accelerate the pace of change. In order to, to achieve our aims, we need to resource the Bill's provisions and ensure, in particular, that local authorities are adequately resourced. I hope today to provide you with the necessary assurance that the Government's financial estimates are as good as they it can be, though there are, of course, uh, as we uh, concede in the Financial Memorandum, challenges in making uh, the estimates. Uh, these challenges primarily arise as the uptake of the new rights will be demand-led, predicting how quickly carers it will take up their new rights and the numbers of carers involved presents a particular challenge. A reasonable starting point must be the extent to which carers presently take up the, their rights. It is fair to say that the existing uh, position or baseline is very low. The introduction of new rights does not mean a sudden reversal of this, but uh, we believe a build-up over several years. Another important cost factor is the average unit cost of the new adult care support plan, young care statement and the support to be provided uh, to carers. Uh, my reply to uh, your uh, letter to me, the, which requested further information, sets out the methodology and assumptions used to determine the average unit costs. Uh, in recognition of the challenges in estimating demand and unit costs, I see merit uh, in further work to refine the assumptions set out in the financial memorandum and the underpinning uh, detail. That's why we will set up a, a finance-led group with key stakeholders, including a cause and carers organisations. Uh, this group will consider cost estimates in further detail. It will also aim to establish a clear understanding of risks and how these uh, can best be uh, uh, mitigated. Uh, the group will build on a considerable level of engagement with local authorities and NHS boards when they were all invited to complete a detailed questionnaire to help inform the financial memorandum. And as I undertook to do in my letter to convener, of course, we will keep you appraised of the work of that a group. There is another factor uh, with a possible impact on the potential cost of employment to build this relates to regulations which set out the circumstances in which uh, charges are waived for support to carers. Some local authorities say they are having issues with the operation of the current regulations. We are working with key stakeholders, uh, again including COSLA and the national carers organisations, to find uh, a solution if there are cost implications for any mechanism we seek to introduce at stage two of the bill uh, to do with the waiving of charges, uh, then of course the financial memorandum uh, would be revised to take into account any uh, additional uh, costs. Again, of course, that was set out in the original financial memorandum and I was able to re-emphasise that in my letter uh, to you, uh, convener. I know uh, that uh, my officials brought uh, in cause to the thinking on the cost estimates. Of course, there are a chance of building up the estimates. I do think Cosler could have presented their own estimates to us. They were certainly given uh, the opportunity to do so, and indeed uh, that opportunity uh, remains and perhaps can now be uh, best taken forward through uh, the group that I have uh, referred to. An important point is that the existing funding through local authorities and NHS boards will uh, remain in place. Local authorities are using resources now to support carers and should continue uh, to do so. However, there is a significant difference between the estimates and the costs as the bill is implemented. We will uh, need to look at the issues again, like the overall Scottish Government financial settlement and the options available to us uh, at that time alongside uh, other commitments, uh, just as we would uh, in the setting of any uh, budget process. I think that's all I've got to say at this stage, Convener. Of course, I'm happy to field any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you very much. And as you'll know, I'll start with some opening questions and then we'll open out the session to uh, colleagues uh, around the, the committee. And I'd like to thank you, first of all, for the correspondence that you've engaged in uh, with the committee. Uh, one of the areas uh, that came up was um, when the bill team was asked whether the cost of replacement care would be a major cost of the bill, uh, 
the, the bill team responded, and I quote, I think it's fair to say that a further financial memorandum should be presented. Is there any intention to present a further uh, financial memorandum at this stage? Well, I think this is obviously a, a critical uh, part of uh, the uh, process. We obviously did set out in the financial memorandum presented that this is an issue that has arisen. I've set that out in my opening uh, statement to you, uh, Convener. So this is an issue that we are uh, exploring further. We have set out that uh, it could be that we seek to bring forward uh, some uh, changes at, at stage two of the bill. So we've let uh, the Parliament and this committee know at the outset that that is uh, a possibility. And of course, if uh, that uh, involved uh, substantial change to uh, the terms of the original financial memorandum, then yes, of course, and as again was set out in the uh, financial memorandum, we would present a, a supplementary financial memorandum. Because I, I recognise it as a former member of this committee, I know that it's uh, critical for this committee to rigorously assess any of the uh, financial implications of any of the provisions we take forward in legislation. So that was a long way of saying, yes, there would be a convener. Much for that. I mean, obviously, we, we're well aware that when you produce these financial memorandum, you cannot always be absolutely spot on. We are looking at best estimates. But, of course, the concerns that have been brought to the committee's attention are that, the, the, that from many of the stakeholders, they're not the best estimates. I mean, for example, uh, you'll be aware that SWS commented on the unit costs in the financial memorandum, stating that the selection of the lowest and highest options is biased. Uh, uh, um, and they go on to complain about the average of £176 being taken at the high-end estimate. Therefore, overall, the, the costs themselves are uh, lower than they believe um, is the actual case in reality. And in fact, Cosler have also said that given the FM itself describes the £176 as the average unit cost, it's Cosler's view that in presenting a range of unit costs in the financial memorandum with our £176 at the top range, this is misleading. Uh, except that we're seeking to mislead anyone. Anyway, certainly we wouldn't accept that we've presented uh, biased information. I would uh, say at the outset that uh, actually the process of gathering this information has essentially been led uh, by uh, COSLA. They've uh, been intimately involved in uh, the gathering of the available data in which we've had to uh, to work with. And that's uh, again was set out in uh, the annex that came with my letter to you, uh, uh, Convener. Uh, so we can only work with the information that was uh, available and that was uh, uh, gathered and presented back to us. So there's no attempt to present it in a biased form. There's no attempt to uh, present it in uh, any other way than the, the clearest possible fashion. And uh, indeed, uh, I think I'm right in recollecting that we concede there are uh, some uh, other uh, average costs that we haven't included uh, in the... Uh, consideration because they seem to us to be sort of outliers uh, and it's not only the uh, higher uh, figures that we didn't include when we came to our uh, estimation we also discounted some of the lower uh, estimates as well which uh, you know if we've included that then I think we could have been opened included one rather than the other uh, then I think uh, we could have been open to accusations of bias but you know I, I understand there are concerns I suppose that's why we've set out the willingness to establish this group uh, we said in the financial memorandum, I think paragraph 7 of the financial memorandum makes clear that uh, as we're willing to hear more information, we're aware that COSLA have concerns. I would uh, say, uh, convener, that uh, I've met with the uh, spokesperson for uh, health and wellbeing from COSLA and I've made the offer uh, to him and uh, his colleagues that if they have, if COSLA have alternative estimates, if they have an alternative methodology, then we're very willing to see it. Uh, thus far, they have not sent that to us. I reiterated that offer in a letter to the spokesman, and again, we have not had that uh, thus far. So we are uh, doing what we can to engage with COSLA to, to speak to them about any concerns they have. And of course, we've invited them to take part in the, the finance-led group as well, although, again, thus far, we've not had a reply from them, but I'm sure we'll have one soon. Okay, when did you contact them? Uh, you... In terms of the finance uh, group, mm -hmm. we contacted them uh, last week, I think I'm right in saying. Mm. So it's probably a wee bit early for them to get back to you, I mean, I would imagine. But Potentially, I should say, there are others being invited who have got back, convener. That's right. not a criticism of uh, COSLA per se. I'm just making the point that the offer's there. Okay, they probably have yet got to get to. back probably have to consult their members. But, I mean, one of the things, the issue is not just the, the, the amount of money, but obviously the scale. I mean, for example, um, we're talking about, you know, in terms of the adult care support plans being a 16% increase over five years, whereas, uh, 
You know, uh, North Ayrshire Council have said, you know, that um, they actually expect it to be 53% in the first year and not as stated the bill when carers come forward. So I think that there's an issue about the fact that uh, uh, people having their, their annual carers plans reviewed and that that would increase um, the number of people who would uptake um, uh, the uptake of, of, of um, um, uh, uh, these resources. And, and, I, and I think it's not just about, the, as I said, about the amount, but it's about the scale. Um, and it's just about how you... How you why is there such a... It, it just seems to me, and, and I believe other members of the committee, there seems to be a wide divergence. It's not that there is a divergence. We expect that in all uh, bills, as you know. You've, you've, you've been through many of them when you were on this committee. But there does in this bill seem to be quite a, a, a tremendous differential in the, the, the range of uptake um, uh, which uh, local authorities anticipate as to the Scottish Government. Well, I mean, I, I suppose I would accept, and I think... Um, we would all accept that uh, this is going to be demand-led, so it is difficult to uh, forecast what that demand uh, might uh, look like. I'm sure we'll all appreciate that now. Uh, of course, I was a former member of uh, this committee, and I know the Finance Committee expects us to say more than that. So what we've attempted to do is present our uh, best uh, estimate. I think uh, the forecast that we've set out is uh, not unreasonable one for a variety of factors convene. I think the first point I would make is that there is, at this present moment in time, a very low baseline of uh, an estimated, I think, 12,000 adult carers getting uh, a carer assessment. So that's got to be a starting uh, position. Uh, the removal of the regular and substantial test uh, to be eligible to be uh, take part in the assessment process, I don't think will in of itself uh, result in a large increase in the number of uh, carers requesting uh, 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 an assessment because we know, or as known, those who have responded, the majority of councils do not use uh, that test, uh, uh, and indeed we have supportive quotes from uh, local authorities uh, about uh, removing this barrier to assessment. Uh, Aberdeenshire uh, told us that it will improve uh, equity and consistency. Uh, those who decline a carer's uh, assessment just now will not all want the, to go through the new process. Some might, uh, perhaps those who feel the current assessment is stigmatised, but others decline the assessment because they are content to be involved in other procedures with the community care assessment of the care for person. Or, and we know this is an issue and one we do want to challenge, but there is a, often there also the issue that some people do not perceive themselves to be carers or some already feel supported, and that's very clear from the, the questionnaire return. So, you know, a number of those people will probably not request uh, an assessment. And I know there was also a suggestion that it should be compared to uh, free personal care. I don't think that's a fair uh, or direct uh, uh, comparison. I think it would be reasonable to have uh, expected uh, take-up of free personal care to be higher than the take-up of the new rights uh, set out in this bill. Uh, certainly initially, uh, this is primarily because, of course, those uh, entitled to free personal care are already receiving local authority services and, in many cases, were in the care home. In fact, that makes it much easier to raise awareness of the new rights and also meant that the cohort of people who have been targeted by those provisions were already in contact with the state. So we've done our best here to come up with what we think is, is a reasonable uh, estimate. I accept it is an estimate by its very nature. This is a, a demand-led process. I know that the committee wants to have as much information as uh, it possibly can. I think that's uh, absolutely the right thing for the committee to, to seek through the, any financial memorandum we present. So that's what we've tried to do. OK, I want to move on to a couple of areas. And I'm going to do a wee... Uh, uh, I may round up before I move on... Before, uh, uh, I'll open up the session because I know colleagues want to ask specific areas which I'm deliberately avoiding because they want to ask uh, th those. But, um, but the National Carers Organisation has noted that, and I quote, the costing for the duty in relation to provision of adult carer support plans appears to be based on the model of a one off intervention, but that an outcome based support plan is a process rather than a single event. So I wonder if you can address that particular issue. And secondly, the same organisation say, and I quote, it is important all staff who carry out this task have the correct skills to do so and experience in working directly with carers. And additional training and learning may be required and will have associated costs. And the reason they say that is because they have concern that uh, the, the ACSPs might, um, uh, might have cost reductions due to changes to the mix of staff grades and skills. 
In other words, um, the people who carry out that will not be as qualified as perhaps they need to be, is the fear from the, the National Carers Organisation. So I wonder if you can address those two issues. Well, let me take the second one uh, first. Uh, I understand where that perception may come from. I think the point that we're trying to make is that uh, although we're implementing provisions here that ensure if people have certain rights, we're not being uh, entirely uh, specific about how that may be delivered on the ground in each local authority area. So it is for the local authority area to determine how uh, they uh, implement that assessment process. So that could involve, for example, uh, working with uh, third sector organisations. We know that that happens in some areas in terms of carers' assessments, and there are some good examples of that being done on a very cost-effective basis, uh, indeed, uh, convener. So I suppose the point we're trying to make is that there could be a range of options for uh, delivery of the uh, assessment process. In terms of the, uh, the issues, uh, the concerns of uh, national carers' organisations about uh, the costs we have for uh, the, the, the unit costs, uh, just to, to clarify, I think you're talking more about the cost of support rather than the, the cost of assessment. If I can just clarify with you, Convener, is that what you're talking about? Well, what they're basically saying is, you know, that uh, it's not a one-off intervention and costs are being assessed on that basis, uh -huh. but it's an outcome-based support plan is a process, so therefore the costs have been underestimated because uh -huh. there's additional costs to what have been considered by the Scottish Government. OK, well, I mean... All, again, all we can do is go on the best information we have. So in terms of the, the unit cost of support, it is based on research. And, and interestingly, given that these are concerns that are being expressed, uh, as you say, by a carers' organisation, it comes from a carers' organisation um, themselves. So it's the, they were the Princess Royal Trust for carers at the time. They're now uh, the Carers' Trust. And that is for a direct uh, bespoke uh, for, uh, support, um, excluding information advice, which is costed uh, separate. And of course, one of the uh, provisions of this bill is to ensure, uh, and I think this is an essential part of the uh, legislation we're seeking to take forward, that there should be that information advice service uh, provided uh, in each local authority area. But in terms of the, the unit cost we have uh, presented, that comes from a carer's organisation itself. Uh, again, we can only go on the, the information we have available to us. I mean, okay, I appreciate that. I mean, but, I mean, we all want to see this uh, legislation successfully implemented, and just just want to make one further point before I open up to colleagues, which is basically that throughout this financial memorandum, there seems to be a very distinct pattern. You know, in terms of the unit costs, uh, the average seems uh, the, the, the Scottish government says seems to be lower than what um, stakeholders are saying. In terms of the scale, i.e., the numbers of people who would have to be assessed. The Scottish Government seems to be lower than the stakeholders. In terms of the model, again, the Scottish Government doesn't seem to have assessed the full cost in terms of the, the ongoing support that's required. And also in terms of training and staff needs, again, there tends to be an underestimate because perhaps people of less, who are less qualified would be expected to do this work, but may not necessarily be doing it. So there seems to be a pattern across the board in terms of, having touched on some of the things that I know John and others want to ask about, that there seems to be, an, you know, when you have an FM, you have some stakeholders that say, we think it's going to cost a bit more, it might cost a bit less. But the problem with this FM, it seems, it seems to be in each of these categories, it seems to be pretty consistently cost underestimations according to stakeholders and when you put that all together into one package you're talking about a, a significant sum of money uh, you know and that's you know one of the concerns well a major concern I have in terms of this legislation I can understand that concern I suppose I would make the point and I, I would make it in the, with the best will that you know we have presented the methodology we've presented where our uh, estimates uh, have derived from uh, what I'm hearing in terms of some of the, the critique is that they're wrong not hearing so much that and here's what we think it will be and this is how we've arrived at that position um, particularly in relation to causes criticism of the unit cost of the assessment process so but you know we're, we've, we're, we'll be reasonable about it we're more than willing to engage in continuing dialogue with those stakeholders to hear the concerns uh, they have we've done that thus far we'll continue to meet them it does uh, require at some stage to I think for some information to be provided so that we can uh, also assess what their perspective might actually be and they can set out what their best estimate is. I, I've not heard that thus far. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'll open out the session now and uh, the first person to ask a question will be Deputy Convener, before by Gavin. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. 
Um, as you probably realise, Minister, at the previous meeting when we met the build team, we spent a bit of time on replacement care, and that's the kind of area that I'm interested in. Um, I mean, we had this interesting quote at uh, it's column 61 of the official report. Cosla and some local authorities have told us that it is unfortunately not possible to say whether replacement care benefits the carer or the cared-for person. If it benefits the carer, the charges would be waived. If it benefits the cared-for person, normal charging would apply. I mean, I do understand that. I, I just think an ordinary person reading that or hearing that would find it a little bit frustrating and a little bit odd that we're getting bogged down in this. Um, I mean, clearly, if a carer goes away for a week, and if it's a young person, maybe to a camp or some kind of holiday, that's great. The person who's been cared for needs to go into a care home, probably, although we can discuss there might, there might be other ways of dealing with that. Um, you, you know, really, can we not break through this as to, well, who benefits? Because I think primarily it's the care, carer that's benefiting, but, you know, maybe the cared for person gets a bit of benefit. Have we, got, have we got to get bogged down in this? I hope we won't get bogged down in it, uh, Mr Mason, but it's certainly you're getting to the nub of uh, the issue at hand, and that's one that we are presently trying to discuss with uh, COSLA, with the carers organisation, to see if we can establish the best way forward. Now, what I would say is there are regulations out there. Uh, what we are responding to is a concern from uh, certain local authorities who say they're having difficulty interpreting them. Now, I'm pushing my officials to make sure I'm getting the best possible evidence to see what the actual picture is on the ground, but we'll continue to have a dialogue with those stakeholders, with COSLA, with local authorities, with the CARES organisation to see about the best way forward. And that's where it gets back to the, the point, the open question from the convener that could result in us presenting fairly substantial amendments to the bill at stage two, which could require uh, a supplementary financial memorandum at that time, which I know the committee would take an interest in at that stage. Okay, I mean, the convener already thanked you for the uh, correspondence, and I, I'm appreciative as well because it's clarified one of the points I was raising. Because when we talked about uh, waiving charges, I wasn't sure if that only meant the local authorities' charges or if it would include a third party. And I think your correspondence has confirmed that it would include a third party because the if, if a charge was waived, it just means that the local authority would take it on and would not pass it to the... Essentially, the local authority... The only interaction of the, the private sector, who I think the, the example you were giving, is my understanding, Mr Mason, you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, the interaction in this process would be they might be commissioned to by a commissioning body, a local authority, most likely uh, to provide uh, some element of, of care. So uh, I'm not even convinced that we would be empowered as a parliament to... Uh, demand that private uh, organisations waive uh, charges, so it would be the commissioning body, i.e. the local authority, yes. that would have to waive the yes, charges. Yes, my fear was not that we would force them to waive them, but that the per it would just stop, we would stop the cared for person getting the care, and therefore it would stop the carer going away, so it would just kind of block the whole process. So I'm right. reassured no, nice. that that's an option. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that if the cared for person has to go into a care home, and I realise that, I mean, presumably if there's a young carer, it means that there's not a lot of other family and friends who are available to care, so the options then become bringing in enough daycare to keep the person at home or they go into a care home. Well, um, yes. Sorry, please didn't mean to... My on. assumption is that these are the two main options. Yeah, I mean, as, uh, I suppose this gets to the very nub of the legislation we're trying to try to uh, take forward, that in these circumstances you're talking about the young care's uh, statement, uh, and uh, that's uh, an assessment-driven process. It's a needs-driven uh, mm -hmm. process, so they would have identified... Needs that's going to be different different circumstances. So it could be uh, that in some circumstances there are alternative family members who may be able to provide some short term care, but they maybe aren't able to provide that long term care that okay. the the primary carer who has gone through the assessment process is able to provide. So you know there could be uh, different options available. But presumably we could make an estimate at least and say, well, 50% could be cared for at home, 50% would need to go into a care home, or 25, 75, or something like that. It, potentially, I suppose, we're starting to get into the, the realms of uh, us uh, second-guessing where this process of us having dialogue with uh, the stakeholders I mentioned earlier might, might take us. Uh, I, I, and I but surely that would be more of a needs thing, that um, it, w it wouldn't be a question of discussing... We could discuss with COSLA and local government uh -huh. who, who would pay, yeah. but, I mean, if the person needs to go into a home because there are no other family members, 
Yes, I'm with you. Well, yes, I suppose it could be estimated, although um, it is going to be... I mean, the whole point of this bill process is to ensure that it's very person-centred and it's very much driven about the specific needs of individual carers. So it could be quite hard to estimate as well because we presumably don't have all of the available data. It's also going to involve people who aren't in the system right now. So, but, I mean, we would know what it would cost to put somebody in a care home because, broadly speaking, that's... Well, yes, but that then gets us, I think, into the realms of us looking at where, uh, where it becomes, is it replacement care and the rest of it, and it comes into issues of waiving of charges. And I think we, I'd, I'd be loath to start putting down uh, estimates that could be of no relevance to this committee for its, its process of... Well, it strikes me that, that what we would know would be, uh -huh. say, the £500 in the care home. What we uh -huh. don't know is how that gets split up between uh -huh. Scottish Government, local government, the family. Uh -huh. So we know the total cost, but we just don't... We, we'd have to negotiate about how it was split up. Potentially. I, I, I'm, not clear, I'm not quite clear where your question is taking us in relation to this area, though. Well, I, I, th I think my, my point would be that w we know what some of the costs would be or we could estimate what some of the costs would be. Yes. Um, I think there's a separate question as to how, who pays for these costs. Uh -huh. Um, but basically, that's the point I want to make. That's, that's OK. It. Yeah. I, mean, it, it, I mean, this touches on two areas, so some of this could come out through what's assessed and what the person's entitled to, and I suppose we've set out what our average unit cost uh, for that it could be in terms of um, it, where it touches on waiving of charges. I suppose the point I was trying to make um, and seeking to be helpful to the committee is that uh, if we were to start trying to estimate what the potential cost could be of uh, any uh, particular provisions uh, uh, at this stage, it, it might not be that helpful because we haven't worked out what the provisions will look like and that's why I think it's more appropriate for us to provide that in the form of a, a supplementary financial memorandum. All right, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. All by Richard. Um, Mr. Fairly late on in the day at the last evidence session, the Scottish Government said this. The cost of replacement care could be in the region of £30 million across Scotland. That is at present prices. Um, is that £30 million per annum? Uh, we'd need to absolutely clarify that, but I suspect that would be the case. But I would urge the committee not to get hung up. And I say this in the general sense because I know £30 million, and I know from my experience in this committee, Mr Brown, you are always concerned about... Uh, uh, large sums of money uh, of any specific provisions we take forward. So I caveat my comments uh, in that sense. I would not want the committee to get hung up on the £30 million as it relates to the area we've just touched on, because that £30 million encompasses uh, a whole uh, uh, range of uh, expenditure. Some of it's already been uh, expended now. It's, it's, uh, it's expenditure that takes place at this moment in time. So the £30 million is a sort of fairly broad brush. I figured it'd be perhaps a starting point for uh, uh, us to uh, analyse in terms of how we take forward the, the whole area of waiving of charges. Okay, it's not, it's not, but is, is, my question is, is that an annual figure or is that a figure well, I, over sorry, the I thought, of the... I thought I'd answer that. My uh, expectation, and Maureen uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, but yes, I think that would be correct. I'm fairly, fairly certain, but we can confirm with you, absolutely. Yeah. If, if you could, that would be great. Yeah. And then, OK, it, it, take, it makes a range of assumptions, of course, but you must have done some work in order to, to be confident enough to, to publicly state the £30 million. Are you able to share with us, either today or again in writing, how that £30 million figure is built up? How do yeah, yes, of course. I suppose in having us committed to come back to you in writing to clearly establish whether well, no, that's an annual figure, let us commit to doing that as well. Yes, we can provide a further breakdown of what that £30 million relates to, if, if that, the committee would find that useful. Well, we'll definitely just be, be, obviously the, the, the bill is I suppose the reason it's so important is the bill as a whole the maximum annual cost is somewhere in the region of £80 million. Mm -hmm. If there's £30 million on top of that, it's, it's well, potentially the biggest single slice. Well, yeah, I, absolutely. I suppose the point I'm trying to make is it is not likely to be £30 million because um, my understanding is that some of that £30 million already covers money that's being spent just now, so that £30 million encompasses a wider range than would be covered by the 
uh, area of the waiving of charges and okay. replacement care, if that makes sense. It, it does, but I'm, not, I suspect, I'm sure your letter will, will clarify exactly yeah. what, what is existing, because what we're interested in, obviously, as a committee, is what is the additional expenditure as a consequence Indeed. of the spill. So if some of that is already being spent, then that's not really driven by the spill. What, what, I guess what I'm keen to find is yeah. what is the additional expenditure well, as a consequence? I suppose that comes back to my point in terms of we've not quite established the, the provisions that we want to put in place, so it's likely to be that would be set out it's contingent on us agreeing that we will take forward its specific provisions related to the waiving of charges. Because I do make the point there are regulations in place at this moment in time, but we are responding to concerns that have been raised by local authorities. Um, so if we do put in other provisions that uh, require additional government expenditure, we would provide that uh, in advance of stage two in the form of a supplementary financial memorandum. But taking on board your point, and I absolutely understand the need for this committee to have as much information as possible. We can try and break down that £30 million figure for the committee, Mr Brown, and indeed we can clarify whether our view that it would be an annual figure, which I think is correct, is absolutely correct. Okay. Can I, can I take you to the financial memorandum, if it particularly sure. it's the table between paragraphs 79 and 80. The table itself doesn't have a number on it, but because the issue raised by, by the Scottish Government and, and by others is that there's some dubiety in certain cases as to whether the, benef the, ult the key beneficiary is the carer mm -hmm. or the cared for person. Um, if it's the uh, carer, then charges can be waived. If it's a cared for person, then generally they're not. So I understand that distinction. But in that table, you've estimated the number of adult carers who you think uh, are likely to receive support mm -hmm. um, in each of those financial years. Mm -hmm. My question is this. Surely if these, people, if these adult carers have been formally assessed under the system set up by the bill, yes. and the decision taken by those doing the assessment is that that adult carer is entitled to some form of help and support, mm -hmm. then surely in almost all of these cases, it is the carer who is the beneficiary, because that is the assessment of the professionals undertaking the work? Yes, but this uh, this relates, if I'm reading it correctly, and let me just uh, look at it in more detail quickly. I think this relates more directly to the uh, provisions that are on the face of the bill just now. So uh, the issue of whether replacement care benefits the carer or the uh, care for person more is uh, tied up with the, uh, with the whole issue of waiving of charges. So that, that's, that's, that's not covered the, in this table. But if, okay, okay. But if, if, maybe I'm missing something here then, but if, if the adult carer has been assessed mm -hmm. professionally mm -hmm. as being deserving and requiring of a break or some other form of respite, yes. surely then the beneficiary is the carer. This is, they have been, it's not as if someone has gone into care for a week and the carer said, oh, right, I think I'm just going to take a holiday. This is a formal assessment that yes. the carer is entitled. And so surely the, the key beneficiary here is a carer under this uh -huh. new bill. Yes, if the short break was determined as part of that assessment, then yes, I don't think we could get away from the fact that they'd be the, the primary beneficiary. OK. But so surely then on your... On your uh, financial memorandum in this particular table, uh -huh. almost all of these people here then, if it's 153,811 in 2021-2022, yeah. then is it not a safe assumption that almost all of that 153,000, you could say the carer is the beneficiary and therefore you could well, Not all of likely. these people ne will necessarily get a, a short break identified as part of their sure. carer's assessment. And I think we're maybe talking slightly at cross purposes because the issue uh, isn't so much the short break they're entitled to, it's whether or not the replacement care that would be uh, necessitated by the virtue of the fact that the carer has now got an entitlement to a short break, sure. so if there's replacement care put in place, the question now becomes, and this is what local authorities say they are having difficulty in assessing under the current uh, provisions that exist in statute, is whether the replacement care is of primary benefit to the carer or the care for person. So that's sure, what we're trying to bottom out. That's what we're, talk we're talking to causal and local authorities about. I don't think we can escape that of a short break, which may necessitate replacement care, but we can't get away from the fact that if a short break is identified as part of the assessment for any carer, is identified as a benefit to the, car the carer indeed. 
Sure, sure, I accept they don't all get a break. There are various assessments. But ba based on the current position, mm -hmm. could you not make some working assumption on what percentage of people are likely to be assessed as requiring a short break as to uh, some other form of respite? And could you not then use the same assumption to work out, at the moment, what percentage of uh, carers sent on short breaks actually do qualify um, for the respite care to be uh, paid for or the charges to be waived? I mean, it, there must be some data there already that you could use to, to have at least have an estimate yeah. for well, the figure. In terms of, we obviously have uh, said that there will be, as part of the uh, financial memorandum, we said that there's uh, an extra £2.36 million pounds, uh, for uh, for short breaks, and that comes as an assessment of the additional numbers we believe would be potentially entitled to short breaks through this this process. So we have attempted uh, to uh, undertake that assessment, uh, uh, Mr. Brown. So that that information is in the financial memorandum. Okay. So you then, if you know the, the percentage entitled to short breaks based on the current figures, then you must have some idea of for for every hundred uh -huh. uh, carers that go on a short break. You must have some idea of the current makeup of what percentage of the people that they care for mm -hmm. have, would, are entitled to the charges being waived mm -hmm. and which percentage are not entitled. That, that information must be... Well, yes, I mean, the, pre the people will ultimately hold that information, and again, Maureen can correct me if I'm wrong, but it uh, would be local authorities, and that's part of the, the process of us seeking to engage with local authorities to try and establish exactly what the, the picture is, and indeed, uh, for... Me primarily, as the minister with responsibility for this bill, to try and establish what exactly is the nature of uh, the, the the problem and the concerns that have been identified by the local authorities in interpreting whether or not replacement care is of benefit to uh, one party or the other. Okay. Um, let's go back to that table then uh, mm -hmm. between 17 and 18 on a slightly different issue then. So that, that's a replacement care cover. I'll move on to a different. Uh, some people have suggested that the overall number of people that are likely to be entitled to receive report, some people are suggesting you've underestimated the number that are likely to be entitled to support. If you look at the first uh, line there, 2017-18, mm -hmm. your uh, assumption, uh, we'll just work with adult carers for just now, your assumption is that uh, 11,175 people will be entitled to support mm -hmm. uh, of some description, that's 2% mm -hmm. of the, the care. Can population. I just clarify, sure. it's not so much entitled who will come forward to to, to seek that support. Well, you've said it's, you've said it's likely to receive report. Yes. See, it receives. So it's not just people who come forward. You, this is your estimate of people Sorry, that will receive yeah, it. My, yes, it's yeah. those, but those of those who come forward who will be entitled to yeah. Well, no, you're saying it's 2% of the carer population yes. on the table. Uh -huh. yeah. That's correct. Okay. Right, so you're saying that 2% of the carer population will receive support in the year 1718. Mm -hmm. But yet, in the same memorandum, if you go to paragraph 81, you're saying that the surveys you've read show that 4% of carers said they receive short breaks or respite care. So if it's 4% of carers getting it from your previous surveys, why are you suggesting it will be 2% in 1718 at a time when obviously a lot of advertising will take... I mean, I'd have thought it would be higher than the current 4% if you're advertising and telling people they're entitled to it? The, the, the nature of the support here is important because this is referring to the bespoke form of support. So um, we estimate that uh, at the moment there's less than 2% of carers have the carers' assessment. So we're starting from a very low baseline. Um, so even from that starting point, so say 2% of those who are currently assessed come forward for the new support plan or for a review for a new support plan. Um, however, um, then there is a range of general support that's available to them. So there is um, you know, the advice, advice and information services that's available to them. And we know from um, pretty, pretty uh, robust research that that is, is tremendously beneficial and it's, all, it's the kind of second priority for carers in terms of our understanding of what carers want. So the first thing carers want is that the services for their cared for person are right and the cared for person is, be, is being properly cared for with their health and social care. The second thing, when they begin to think about their own needs, they want information and advice. And that's why um, there's, there's a commitment there to, to continue to do that. 
through uh, the NHS and through um, the local authorities commissioning the voluntary sector who have real, real skills in this and the local authority role in coordinating advice and information. So that's, that's a really important part of this for us. Um, and also accessing local community services that are available to anyone in any community who needs a bit of particular support. So when those options are, are exhausted, then there's, the, then there's this um, financial uh, estimates around bespoke support, which would inc can include things like short breaks or a range of things, advocacy, you know, th things that carers need and want that can't be provided in other ways. Okay. Look, look you're saying in 2017-18, 11,175 uh, carers will receive support. That, that's your projection. What, what would... What is the actual raw number then for the current financial year or the last financial year in terms of the number of carers who received support? If you don't have that to hand up, I don't know. Do you have that to hand, Mr. Brown? I think we might need to. Uh, that would be useful. Hand just hand so to make sure I'm comparing the right thing, it just it yeah. just strikes me that on well, the face of it, it looks like the numbers go down slightly, but you're spending three million a year on giving information and advice. Could, I, I just I think it's probably going to be best to try and clarify the sure. writing with you, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Brown. Fine. Okay. Um, last, last question then really is just if, if the uh, charges do have to be waived and local uh, authorities have to mm -hmm. uh, carry the cost as it were, you're going to bring back another financial memorandum. Strict. But is, is, in advance of that, is there a broad commitment from government, the Scottish government, that they will underwrite the cost of that? Well, I th we need to agree. We're obviously in dialogue with local authorities. Now, if there's anything as a consequence of um, the legislative process that we uh, decide to take forward, then ultimately, I suppose the answer will likely be yes, but we're in the process of trying to work out what that may be, and that involves uh, dialogue with local authorities. So part of that will be about how we actually pay for the, the provisions of whatever is put in place. Sure. OK, thank you. Actually got one question. No, Mr Brown's covered some of the areas I was uh, going to cover, but that last point is absolutely crucial because on replacement care, this could end up being the biggest cost in the legislation, and we don't have it in memorandum as it is at the moment. We appreciate the Minister says there will be a further financial memorandum to come. But in terms of providing clarity on this issue, in terms of who would be entitled to that uh, replacement care funding, isn't that something that could be resolved in this legislation at stage two to help provide clarity to that issue? Yeah, yes, I think it would be. I mean, I think that's the, at the nub, so of, the, so that's can, a, that's at the yeah. nub of, of the, this whole area. That's what we're seeking to do. Just so you're now. going to bring forward a financial memorandum, uh -huh. but additionally, potentially, amendments legislation to provide clarity Sorry, on the yes, legal the, status of that issue. I should be clear, we will only bring forward a financial memorandum if we present amendments at stage two. I think not only would, will we do this, I think we would be required to do this understanding orders of this parliament that uh, substantially alter the, uh, the financial uh, commitment that would uh, fall upon government or indeed any other uh, party as a result of the legislation we take forward. Thank so, you, yes, it, it would be on the basis that yeah. we are seeking to amend the bill. Yes. And just to be clear, for me, you are seeking to amend the bill. That therefore it's your, your, that's, your, the, your, that's the working assumption, but we're, in, we're engaged in dialogue on uh, this uh, matter just now. I mean, I would make the point there are regulations at present that should cover these matters, but the point has been made by local authorities that they have difficulties with them. So we are indicating willingness to engage in dialogue with well, them. Absolutely, this. Minister. But I think for us, in uh, terms of Parliament, proceeding with the legislation to ensure that the funding is there to make that part of the bill actually relevant work and be meaningful, that th th those young carers can get that respite, then it's, it's important for us, whatever the circumstances, to have an indication of what the cost will be, of course. You know, and in the future as well. So, so will the nature of your amendment be basically to clarify these regulations? Is that basically what your the, the intention is? And I suppose I suppose my, my other question is, I mean, what happens if you don't reach an agreement with COSLA? Will you then just have to impose something because you're accepting that the bill requires this, basically? Well, it's not so much about imposition. I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that there are regulations, there is guidance in existence at this moment in time. We are responding to a concern that has been expressed to us, uh, Mr Chisholm, by local authorities and we're reasonable people. So we want to uh, engage in dialogue with them and uh, ultimately if that requires us to amend this bill to try and clarify matters further and if that 
results and uh, additional financial uh, commitments from the administration, then we'll not only present the amendments, but we'll present the supplemented financial memorandum. I, I can't really say in much detail what the amendments will look like, no, because no. We're, we're engaged in a, a, an open process with uh, those who've raised the concerns. But also, crucially, mm. uh, we've got to talk to the carers' organisations about this as well. But would it be fair to say that the government itself has a clear view of its interpretation of the regulations, and therefore, although you're describing all this in terms of dialogue with COSLA, I mean, do, do you have a view about uh, how you think the regulations should be interpreted? Well, uh, that's why I'm seeking further uh, information from not only my officials, but also trying to get the perspective of uh, local authorities. So. I'm clear that there are regulations. Uh, I'm uh, less clear on uh, their efficacy uh, and uh, how they're working on the ground. I want to try and establish that picture. I mean, again, I'm happy to keep the uh, committee, although I know that uh, uh, this is sort of more as a policy area, so it might be the Health and Sport Committee that take a greater interest in the specific policy provisions. But I'm obviously happy to keep the committee appraised of where we take this work. So what's the likely timescale of all this? I mean, when, when, would, when would we expect stage two of this bill to be? Let's try and get over stage one first. Um, You've got over the summer to do it, basically. Uh, well, indeed, yeah. yes, because yeah. we, we don't expect uh, mm -hmm. us to be concluding stage one till right. after the summer mm -hmm. recess, so it gives us a period of time to, to continue that work. Yeah. Uh, I should say um, that, uh, you know, that, that work um, is of, of uh, paramount importance because uh, we, if we're going to uh, take it forward as part of this uh, bill process, we don't want to delay matters. Carers are out, out there are, are keen and hungry for this bill to go forward. Um, they do have views and uh, other changes that could be made to the bill and we'll be seeking to engage with uh, the carers' organisations about that, but uh, I don't want to do anything that will delay this bill unduly. Well, sorry, given that the, um, <coughs> the, the uh, stage one isn't going to happen until after the summer recess, is there any reason why we can't actually have a supplementary financial memorandum before stage one? Um, can I uh, reflect on uh, that, convener? I suppose, well, let me commit to if, and I suppose we're still in the stage of uh, the realms of if, it is our assumption that it will be necessary, but it is uh, still an if there is a need for a supplementary financial memorandum. Can I commit to getting it to the committee as soon as possible then? Okay. Um, thank you. We'll correspond on that issue. Are there any other um, points that you want to uh, raise with the committee? You no, I mean, I suppose I would uh, make the point that I'm, I, I know the committee takes... Uh, its responsibilities in terms of financial scrutiny very seriously as a former committee member and if we can provide any additional detail we've obviously committed to doing that in terms of particularly Mr Brown's uh, areas of uh, interest if there are other issues convener then please do not hesitate to, to contact me again. Okay thank you very much Minister Dr Bruce. Uh, that concludes our uh, public uh, deliberations today. I'm therefore going to um, close the public um, section of today's business and we'll just have a one minute recess uh, to allow official report and uh, witnesses to leave um, committee, members, committee members just uh, hang for just a minute and we'll uh, go on to our last item of business